Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. It is the episode hosted... No, it's the podcast hosted by Spencer, who is me. And I read the words and the definitions and all the things in this book that I feel like reading, and then I talk about it. And you get to learn more about the things than just what says it. what it says here. I try to add a little bit more. And then you get to learn about me. This is all about how I process everything in the world or when it's done it will be me how how do i process it how do i view it what's what's my lens like how can i how can i teach it to you in another way i don't know that's what it is it's my podcast the first word in this podcast is die out d i e second word o u t intransitive verb from 1853, and this is sort of tagging on to the end of the previous episode, which was uh, we had two forms of die off. So this one is die out, and it just means to become extinct. Whenever a plant species or animal species or fung- fungi, fungi species just becomes extinct, it has died out no more. It's not in the process of dying off. It's gone. No more. Never to come back again. Die out. Uh, The sound effect shall be something like yummy. Sometimes they're not sound effects. Sometimes they're words. Don't worry about it. The next word is diuresis, which is a variation of diuresis spelled with an A near the beginning, D-I-A-E-R-E-S-I-S. And this word here is D-I-E-R-E-S-I-S. You'll notice I did not say an A for that one because we're not in the D-I-A section. We're in the D-I-E section, which uh, that that's going to go until the next episode. The next word, yummy yum, diesel or diesel. With an S or a Z sound. D I E S E L. Noun from 1894. Number one, this synonym is diesel engine, which we will get to soon. It's the engine that uses the diesel gas, the diesel fuel, and uh, sometimes they just shorten the whole engine just to diesel. The number two for diesel is a vehicle driven by a diesel engine. So the car, the vehicle can be called a diesel, and the engine can be called a diesel. And then number three, the synonym is diesel fuel. So the actual fuel can just be shortened down to diesel. Diesel feasel weasel diesel. The next word, yum. Diesel electric. Two words with a hyphen. Adjective from 1914. Whoa, 1914? Diesel electric? This seems like a hybrid situation. It goes all the way to to uh, 108 years ago. Of relating to or employing a diesel engine for driving an electric generator or for cha- for charging batteries. So it is a diesel engine which is using diesel fuel but it is used for an electric generator. That's why it's diesel electric. Ah, okay. As in the example, a diesel electric locomotive. What sort of electric generator do they have on a locomotive? I don't know my train so good. Also as in diesel electric submarines. So yeah, I guess it's just this uh, this engine that uses diesel fuel to make an electric generator go maybe if the power goes out the the generator needs to kick in and it's got to have some diesel fuel in it yummy the next word is diesel engine two words noun from 1894 oh i forgot to mention back in diesel uh this is named after rudolf diesel and uh maybe we'll put a link in the show notes for diesel so you can learn more about it Um, But, uh, yeah, named after Rudolf Diesel. Maybe he invented it, I think, maybe? So, diesel engine is from the same year, 1894. An internal combustion engine in which air 
is compressed to a temperature sufficiently high to ignite fuel injected into the cylinder where the combustion and expansion actuate a piston. So, the, clearly this is different than a non-diesel engine, whatever whatever sort of regular gasoline is called, petrol, gas. Um, is it a temperature change? I don't really know the differences between diesel fuel and other fuel. Um, and, and Well, let's read the next one. Maybe this will help, but I don't think it will. Yum! Diesel fuel, two words, noun from 1949. So, I guess before 1949, we just called diesel fuel diesel, because the word diesel is from 1894. So over 50 years later, they said, ah, maybe we should call it diesel fuel. We're getting confused, because diesel can be used for so many things. The engine, the vehicle, the fuel. So what is diesel fuel? It is a heavy mineral oil used as fuel in diesel engines. And it doesn't say anything about why or how this is different from the other fuel. So we'll put a link in the show notes. I'm aware that there are certain things, certain cars and trucks and generators that use diesel specifically. Don't put diesel fuel in your non-diesel vehicle. Just don't do it. It's a bad idea. Uh, yeah, link in the show notes if you want to learn more about what what is this stuff and why is it different. I think I've heard that it's better for the environment. I think, maybe, I don't know. I hope I was hoping I could get to learn something extra here, but I guess not. The next word, yummy. Dieseling, with an I-N-G, noun from circa 1955, the continued operation of an internal combustion engine after the ignition is turned off. Hmm, interesting. Obviously, people who know about diesel vehicles and stuff are aware of this, but I'm not. So after the ignition is turned off in the vehicle, the engine, this diesel engine, keeps on running for a certain period of time, and that's called dieseling. Maybe it just takes some time for it to cool down. Hmm. Yeah, and you got to be aware of this if you're going to have one of these vehicles. The next word. Yummy. Dieselize or dieselize with an I-Z-E at the end. Transitive verb from 1925. To equip with a diesel engine or with diesel electric locomotives. Maybe you want to change your car from a regular engine car to a diesel engine car, and so you can dieselize it. Dieselize it. Dieselization is a noun. Treat yourself with the dieselization. The next word. No more diesel words. Diesel. It's a very silly word. If you don't know the word, I had just imagined it in my head being spelled like D-E-E-Z-L-E. And it's, I don't know, is it the name of a, of a silly character? Diesel? Weasel? Okay. The next word. Yummy. Dies ira. Uh, no, dies ira. Dies ira. This is two words. The first word is just D-I-E-S with a capital D. And the second word is capital I-R-A-E. Dies Ire. Dies Ire. Noun from 1860, a medieval Latin hymn on the day of judgment sung in requiem masses. This is Middle Latin and it means day of wrath. So Ire means wrath. W R A T H. And this is from the first words of the hymn. So it starts off Dies Ire. And maybe if I can put a, if, if I find some uh, audio of some people singing this medieval Latin hymn, we'll put it in here and you'll hear them start off with Dies Ire. Maybe it's Dies Ire. But I don't know how it goes. Dies Ire. It's about the day of judgment. Mm, I bet you there's more. 
there's some good information in here. Maybe we'll put a link in the show notes also so you can uh, read the words in English and see what it says. The next word. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Diasis. Diasis. D-I-E-S-I-S. Noun from circa 1706. The synonym is double dagger. And I don't know, is this a dagger with blades on both sides? Like, you hold the hilt, and then there's... It's kind of like the Darth Maul uh, lightsaber, where there's sharpie things that go off in either direction. Is that what this is? Hmm. The etymology, there's a whole lot more to that than just the definition. So this is probably from Italian, which means sharp in music. Uh, It's also a symbol for a sharp, like in music you have sharps and flats and neutrals. Um, Also from Middle Latin, which means quarter tone. From the Latin, from Greek, dienai, which means to send through, which is dia, plus hainai, which means to send. And there's more at the word jet. I don't know what we're talking about anymore. Sharp daggers, music, jet engines? What is this? Maybe we'll... I don't know if it's music or... Well, actually... I feel like, I don't know, maybe we'll put a link in the show notes or something in social media, because, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know what this diocese is. I do think that maybe they call the sharps daggers. Maybe it's like a slang thing, and then if there's two of them, it's a double dagger, which is a diocese. I feel very silly and dumb right now. The next word, yum diester or it's diester diester noun from 1935 a compound containing two ester groups and of course the di prefix means two here two ester groups the next word yum die stock d-i-e stock one word noun from circa 1859 a stock to hold dyes used for cutting threads. Hmm, I don't know. Let's see, we had dye in the previous episode. We were talking about it's like a mold or a thing that creates a shape. So it could be that. And I think a stock, I guess this is the, uh, maybe it's a vice or something that's going to hold this dye in place while it's being used. I, I can only assume, I think maybe that's what it is. It sounds good to me. The next word. Yum. Diestrous. D-I-E-S-T-R-U-S. Diestrous. Noun from 1942. This is a period of sexual quiescence that intervenes between two periods of estrus. And diestrous, spelled O-U-S, is an adjective. So, yeah, we're using the dia prefix, even though it only is spelled di, dia plus estrus, and dia means through or across, and so this is something that's happening between two periods of estrus, and it's estrus is not a word that gets used particularly often, but I believe that this is the, um, when a Woman, when a person with a uh, uh, with a uterus and a vagina has uh, her mo- the monthly period, um, I believe that is the estrus. So, between two of them, a period of sexual quiescence that intervenes between. So, does that mean that there is no sex happening? Quiescence seems like maybe things are quiet. Not sure. Diestrus, but it's between two periods of estrus. The next word, it's the last word, and we have four forms here in this episode. Yummy, yummy, yummy. It's the word diet. D-I-E-T. Diet, uh, first form, noun from the 13th century, 1A. Food and drink regularly provided or consumed. It's the stuff that you consume or provide to other people uh, that's food and drink. It's just whatever you are eating 
It's your diet. That's what it is. What is your diet? You can tell me. You can send me an email, message, whatever, voicemail. 1B, habitual nourishment. Habitual nourishment. That phrase is a little confusing to me. Your habitual nourishment, I mean, you probably are nourishing yourself. I mean, okay, maybe this isn't exactly food, but maybe it's something that nourishes your soul and you do it regularly and that's your diet? Hmm. I don't know. I think it might be about food, though. 1C, the kind and amount of food prescribed for a person or animal for a special reason. So, yeah, maybe this person has, or, or animal, has a sickness, a disease, uh, some sort of condition, and then they are required to have this special kind of diet. Like I know with cats a lot, they, if they have kidney problems, there's maybe special kidney diet foods, uh, limited ingredients, uh, high protein, no grain, things like that. For Maybe for older cats, they have a special diet. Um, so, yeah, that's one way that you can use that word. What kind of diet is your animal on? Or human, again, all those same things, but they can be for humans too. 1D, a regimen of eating and drinking sparingly so as to reduce one's weight, as in going on a diet. Typically, this one is about reducing the eating and the drinking. Um, So, you know, we're, we're consuming less calories, or less of bad things. Um, But when people say going on a diet, they often mean other things too. Maybe we'll get into them in the second, third, and fourth forms. But yeah, I mean, it could be, there's so many different diets. You could be doing a specific diet. Keto, vegan, Mediterranean, paleo, Atkins, you know, there's there's tons of different diets. Um, You have to find out what's right for you. Everybody's body chemistry is different, but uh, personally for me, it's vegan, and I have heard that the the diet that tops the charts every year is the Mediterranean diet because it is very limited in the, the meat and the dairy, but it has a lot of the veggies and the other plant things that grow, um, and so it's just a really good blend. You're going to be the most healthy theoretically from that for your heart, for your weight, all those things. So I do strongly people, I do strongly urge that people go to as close to a Mediterranean or vegan diet as they can, minimize the meat and the dairy as much as possible, bring up the 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 uh, the veggies, the plants, the legumes, the beans, the the grains, all those things. Number two, for diet first form, something provided or experienced repeatedly, as in. A Diet of Broadway Shows and Nightclubs. And that is a quote from Frederick Wyatt. Uh, I know I know at least one person who regularly goes to see Broadway shows because they love it and they live nearby, so they do have a diet of Broadway shows. Um, so yeah, this is not about food. This is just about something um, that uh, is repeatedly in your life, whatever it is. Maybe it's a diet of movies. I guess I have that. A diet of... Well, my diet consists of reading the dictionary. I have a diet of words. Let's take a quick look at the etymology. This goes down to the Greek diaita. Diaita. It literally means manner of living. What is the manner of living that you have? How do you live? Um, Also from diaitaistai. Diaitaistai. That means to lead one's life. So yeah, it's all about just what's what's your life like? What are the things that you're putting in your body, you're putting in your soul? Your What's the stuff that you consume in various ways? That's your diet. I will say just back on the food thing and when you say going on a diet, um, I... I think, you know, the idea of diet, a temporary diet is okay if you want to, like, maybe lose a bunch of weight or something. Um, but... A lot of people will do a diet and then they'll, you know, then they'll gain the weight again. I'm just using this as an example. Then the diet, then gain the weight again. So you need to find something for you that is not going to be a temporary diet, 
but it is going to be your lifelong diet. You need to find something that is going to work for you, with you, for the long haul. Adjust your diet so it's not a temporary diet. It's a lifestyle change. All right, let's move on to the next one. Ooh, that diet is so yummy. Second form of diet, uh, it's a verb, from the 14th century, starting with transitive. One, to cause to take food, and the synonym is feed. So the last one was the noun, and this is where we, we are dieting, feeding, we're eating. Number two, to cause to eat and drink sparingly or according to prescribed rules. That's where you are cutting down on your food, you are dieting, but you're not dieting, you're not feeding as much. Intransitive is to eat sparingly or according to prescribed rules. So the first one is to cause to eat, making something eat and drink sparingly. And then the other one, the intransitive, is to eat sparingly according to prescribed rules. Dieter is a noun. The one who is doing the dieting, going on a diet, that's that. The next word. Yum, yum. Third form of diet, adjective from 1963. One, reduced in calories, as in a diet soft drink. While, yes, they are reduced in calories, they are often filled with other chemical-y things that are so not good for you. So, uh, I would just strongly urge to just not have any soft drinks in general. But yes, a soft drink that has less calories is a diet soft drink. Two, promoting weight loss as by depressing appetite. Um, promoting weight loss. Uh, oh, there's an example. Diet pills. Yep, you take a pill, it's going to tell your body to not be so hungry, and then you're just going to eat less. And uh, hopefully it works, but again, this is this is a thing that maybe is only good for a temporary time, and uh, you need to find something. Once you get to the weight that you like, adjust your diet so you don't have to take diet pills, because again, I don't think they're very good for you. The last word, yummy, 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 yummy tasty food, eat all the food. That's my diet. The fourth form of diet, noun from 1565. One, a formal deliberative assembly of princes or estates. This is completely different from all the other things that we just read. A formal deliberative assembly of princes or estates. So the people are getting together formally, and it's called a diet. Hmm. Number two, any of various national or provincial legislatures. This is in the, the political world. So why is it called a diet? Because it is from the Middle English diet with an extra E at the end, which means day's journey or day set for a meeting. Back in the day, when they didn't have uh, vehicles and things, maybe it would take a whole day for them to travel from one place to another, and uh, for them to have this meeting, this assembly. So that's that's where the name came from. Um, it's also from the Middle Latin dieta, which literally means daily regimen or diet. And that's taken from the Latin dies or dies, which means day. So yeah, that's what the word diet is. It's just literally what, what you have. Um, you know, we can even connect it to the first form of diet, we, the etymology there said it's a manner of living or to lead one's life, but it all comes down to what is going on in the day. What do you have in your day? What do you fill your day with? What do you consume every day? That's your manner of living. I definitely have not heard it used in this political way, which is probably why they put it in the fourth form, because they said, oh, Spencer, he hasn't heard this one. He's less familiar with it, so we're going to put it at the end. Uh, but yeah, I don't think um, it gets used as often as the other ones. So that's why it's number four. Fourth place. Um, but I do, I'm trying to think, I, I want to know what, what was the context? How did they say this? We're going on a diet. Let's make a diet. And then somehow it changed to food and things. Although the original diet, the first form, is from the 13th century. 
and the fourth form is from 1565. So, yeah, that's that's interesting. All right, we now have to reread the words so we can pick one as the word of the episode. We had die out, diuresis, diesel, diesel electric, diesel engine, diesel fuel, dieseling, diesel dieselize, diacera, diacera, diasis, trying to re- di- no diasis, diasis, diester, diestock, diestris, diet, 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 diet. I guess. I guess maybe I just have to pick diet as the word of the episode. Um, because, because why? Because um, I think you just need to find a good diet that works for you. And a lot of us have not done that yet. Uh, we just keep it, we, we have a diet, but it's making us uh, unhealthy. The whole world, especially in certain countries like the U.S., maybe even Canada, and I think China and lots of other countries, um, you know, we... We are we have this American diet, which is a bunch of just really crappy, cheap food. And I could go on a whole long diatribe about this, to use a recent word. Um, but yeah, basically the government subsidizes the unhealthy things, uh, the industries of, of basically meat and dairy, and so those are a lot cheaper. And they don't subsidize the healthier things as much, like fruits and veggies and beans and legumes and all those things. And so the cheap food is the unhealthy food. So we're all getting unhealthy and medical costs are terrible and people shouldn't be having so much heart attacks and diabetes and high cholesterol and high blood pressure as young as they are. So yeah, it's just a big problem. And uh, we need to fix the American diet and we need to get everybody on better diets. Because why, 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 why? I know it tastes good. We could, There's other food that tastes just as good too that's healthier for you. And it has less suffering involved. That's my opinion. I just hope you have a good diet. Maybe if you love your diet and you you're gonna and you 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 you're on a track to die in ten years and you don't care, fine. That's fine. But I just want people to be healthy and not have to suffer in any way. Is that so much to ask? I don't think so. Diet, find a good diet, diet, eat the food do the things what's your diet like every day what do you do are you gonna go meet some princes and princesses and states that's your diet that's gonna be the end of this episode sometimes we get kind of political and you know you just have to deal with it maybe in the next episode we won't be so political there's a lot of sciencey words so i don't think we will thank you very much for listening and until next time this is spencer dispensing information goodbye Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary, the podcast that you are listening to right now where this guy is reading the dictionary. Yay for that. All right. The first word in this episode is dietary. 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 D-I-E-T-A-R-Y. First form, noun from 1838, the kinds and amounts of food available to or eaten by an individual, group, or population. What what are the things that uh, an individual, group, or population are eating? It's the kinds and the amounts. That's the dietary. Mm, let's see what the next one says. The sound effect will be... Pew! Second form of dietary, adjective from 1614, this one's much older than the previous one, of or relating to a diet or to the rules of a diet, as in dietary guidelines. All the different kinds of diets, maybe we should put a link, maybe in yesterday's episode, there should be a link in the show notes that lists all, all kinds of diets and each one of them has rules. They have rules. You gotta live by the strict rules of a diet, and they they have dietary guidelines. Dietarily is an adverb. The next word, dietary law. Two words, noun from 1907. Dietary law. Any of the laws observed by Orthodox Jews that permit or prohibit 
certain foods. Now, the the, the biggest one, the one that I think most people are aware of, uh, which is also me, is, you know, a food, or there's a couple things. A food's got to be kosher, uh, which I believe is when a, uh, it's the, the food has got to be uh, prepared, killed, processed in a certain way, and also has to be, I believe, um, not prayed over, but has to be blessed, has to be blessed by, I think, a rabbi. So that is what makes food kosher. And there's other things, like I think, you know, for a lot of Jews, there's no no pork uh, in their diet. And so, yeah, it's, it's a law. It's under Jewish law that you can have certain things and cannot have certain things. Uh, and I believe that would also pertain to certain holidays. Uh, you can and cannot eat certain foods during certain holidays. Uh, some Jewish people have uh, two kitchens, a kosher kitchen and a regular kitchen. And so the kosher kitchen is um, it's under dietary law. What can and cannot be in that kitchen? That was never a thing that we did. I, my Half my family is Jewish, but we didn't keep kosher. Nothing like that. And I was a big bacon eater as a kid. The next word. <laughs> dietary supplement. Two words, noun from 1967. A product taken orally that contains one or more ingredients, as vitamins or amino acids, that are intended to supplement one's diet and are not considered food. I'm sorry. You can't take your calcium pills. You can't take a whole bottle of calcium pills or magnesium or B12 or vitamin C. It's not a meal. It doesn't work that way. Uh, But sometimes you do need to supplement your diet with these things like amino acids or vitamins. Examples would be uh, maybe if somebody has some sort of uh, physical condition that they can't maybe eat certain foods or something, they got to add the, these vitamins in other ways. Uh, personally, for me and other vegans, vegetarians, you don't get a whole lot of B12 or, or any B12, which is very important. And so we take B12 supplements. Um, depending on what you're eating and what your lifestyle is like, you may want to take some vitamin D or calcium or other things. You gotta, you gotta talk to a nutritionist and your doctor. The next word. Dietetic is the next word. Dietetic. Adjective from 1579. One. Of or relating to diet. Just anything that's about about diet could be any any one of these diets, the things that you eat, the things that you do in your day, the deliberative assembly of princes or estates, anything that's related to those things are dietetic. Two, adapted for use in special diets. So if there's a special diet and there's some sort of food thing that is made specifically for that diet, gluten-free, vegan, keto, paleo, then it's dietetic. There's a lot, a lot of those dietetic foods in the grocery stores these days. We didn't used to have those just uh, like 15, 20 years ago. Dietetically is an adverb. The next word, dietetics. So we just added an S to dietetic. Noun from 1799, the science or art of applying the principles of nutrition to the diet. Hmm. So there's a special diet, and then just the science or art of of using those, maybe those rules of what the diet says. Uh, That's dietetics. The next word, pew, diether, di Ether, noun from 1950, a compound containing two atoms of oxygen with ether linkages. And that's ether, E-T-H-E-R. Ether, I know, is some sort of uh, liquid thing that if you smell it, you might pass out, I think. They would use this to knock people out. Um, So if there's two atoms of oxygen and they're linked to ether, it's diether. Di means two. Two oxygen atoms. The next word, 
Pew. Diethyl carbamazine. Diethyl carbamazine or zine. Uh, let's see. Let's spell it for fun. D I E T H Y L C A R B A M A Z I N E. Noun from 1948. An anthelmintic administer. An anthelmintic. Administered in the form of its crystalline citrate, C10, H21, N3, O, and then there's a dot in the middle, C6, H8, O7, especially to control human philariasis, philariasis and large nematodes, like heartworms, in dogs and cats. It's an anthelmintic, which I don't know what it is. Uh, let's see, crystalline citrate... It controls human filariasis and uh, things like heartworms in dogs and cats. And this is from the dye prefix plus the, let's see, plus ethyl plus the carb from carboxy and the AM from amide and, and then azine or azin at the end. Sounds like it's useful stuff. The next word, diethyl ether, two words, diethyl ether, noun from circa 1930, and the synonym is the 3A definition for the word ether, which is going to be many months from now, maybe sometime next year or the year after that. Ether. The next word, diethyl stilbestrol. Diethyl still bestrol or stroll. Noun from 1938, a colorless crystalline synthetic compound, C18, H20, O2, used as a potent estrogen, but contraindicated in pregnancy for its tendency to cause cancer or birth defects in offspring. Well, this doesn't sound good. So why would you use it? It's estrogen, so if maybe if somebody is lacking in their estrogen, needs more estrogen for some reason, then I guess that they would maybe use this. But you do not want to use diethyl stilbestrol if you are pregnant or going to be pregnant uh, because it's not, it's not going to be good. Uh, it can cause cancer and or birth defects in the baby. So just uh, maybe stay away from it if you can. Uh, it is called also DES or just Stilbestrol. Both names. The next word. Diethyl zinc. Two words. Noun from 1952. A volatile pyrophoric liquid compound, C4, H10, Zn, used especially to catalyze polymerization and to deacidify paper. So if your paper is acidic and you don't want it to be, then you can use diethyl zinc. But it is volatile, and it's pyrophoric. So that's something about fire. Pyrophoric. Hmm. I have a feeling it's got to be... Got to be... It's it's flammable. Um, but uh, yeah, I, can, I'm, I have a little trouble remembering the phoric... Su uh, suffix there's there's phobic which means it detracts uh things yeah pyrophoric it must be but my, why wouldn't it say flammable hmm yep i i got nothing diethyl zinc the next word dietitian dietitian d-i-e-t-i-t-i-a-n or instead of the second t you can put in a c D-I-E-T-I-C-I-A-N, noun from circa 1846, and it is a specialist in diet dietetics. How do we say this word? Dietetics, uh, which is all about the principles of nutrition of a diet, the science or art. So the dietitian is doing the dietetics to, to learn about nutrition and different diets, and then they're going to help you and tell you what they think you should eat based on what you like and what you want and maybe what your body chemistry might be like. 
dietitians. I don't know if they're different than nutritionists. Can they be the same person? Can you can you get um, can you get uh, certified as one or the other? I think they're definitely different. Nutrition a nutritionist is more about what's in the food and and what things you need from the food. A dietitian, I guess, is more about the specific diets and knowing more about the diets, I guess. The next, oh, that was the last D-I-E word. Here is the D-I-F section, which how long will this one go? One, two, three, three episodes after this one. Three full episodes after this one. Okay, so the next word, boo, it's diff, D-I-F-F, noun from 1896, and this is slang. I don't think of people in the 1800s using slang, but, you know, it's it's been around for a while. Um, so it's uh, slang for just the word difference. What's the difference? What's the diff? It's just, it's just such a funny idea to think of somebody in the 1800s saying, what's the diff? But I guess they did it. The next word. Differ. D-I-F-F-E-R. This is a verb from the 14th century, and I believe it is just intransitive. 1A. To be unlike or distinct in nature, form, or characteristics, as in, the law of one state differs from that of another. They're, they're different. Um, they're unlike each other. They're distinct from each other in the ways of nature, form, or characteristics. So it's obviously not just about the law. It's lots of things. It could be, uh, and it also doesn't have to be states. It's just anything that are different, unlike, or distinct from each other in nature, form, or characteristics. Uh, The definition for differ is going to differ from the definition of another word. They're different. Where are we? 1B for differ is next. To change from time to time or from one instance to another. The synonym is vary, V-A-R-Y. And the example is the number of cookies in a box may differ. That doesn't make any sense to me. Why can't they be standard? What if somebody got four cookies more than my box of cookies had? I'm not going to be very happy about that. Where are my extra cookies? They got to be the same. They should be the same. Hmm. Hmm. I don't like it when they differ. Number two. To be of unlike or opposite opinion. To be of unlike or opposite opinion. The synonym is disagree. As in, they differ on religious matters. Oh, so many people differ on religious matters and political matters. Hopefully, if you are, um, if you and your partner, your one or two partners or whoever they are, if you are going to have a kid, you may want to talk about things like this, like religion, like politics, etc., etc., and see if you differ. You probably already know, but, um... You know, depending on your situation, you may want to differ on things, and you may not want to differ on things. Um, it, I think it's good to be on the same page for a lot of things, but at the same time, it's good to get different viewpoints and opinions in certain ways and certain things. The etymology for differ. It's from the Middle French, differer, which means to postpone or be different, From the Latin differe, which is from dis plus ferre, which means to carry. And there's more at the word bear, like I'm carrying this weight, I'm bearing this weight. And um, that's that's interesting. I don't know how that's your your different. uh, Yeah, yeah, differ. Um, Okay, we have one more word for this episode. Two forms. Uh, first form of the word difference, D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-C-E. Difference or difference. Dif- I, what's the difference between these? Oh, well, it's the difference. Ah, see, that that's funny. Noun from the 14th century. 
Um, 1A, the quality or state of being different. That's it. As in, the difference between right and wrong. Sometimes it's hard to tell what's the difference between right and wrong. Right, right and wrong. Usually it's not that hard. They are quite different, right and wrong. But it's all up to your opinion. You may What you think is right might differ from what somebody else thinks is right. 1B. An instance of differing in nature, form, or quality. As in, noted the differences in color and texture. Uh, yep, there, there are differences in color and texture. That's it. 1C is archaic. A characteristic that distinguishes one from another or from the average. A characteristic that distinguishes... So, oh, the, so the actual characteristic that makes two things different uh, is called the difference. But we don't use this anymore. It's archaic. 1D... The element or factor that separates or distinguishes contrasting situations. So the thing, this is kind of similar to the last one. It's the thing that makes things uh, different, different situations, is the difference. There's no example. Number two, distinction or discrimination in preference, as in timing is often the difference between success and failure. That's that's a very true statement. Distinction or discrimination in preference. Hmm. Yeah, I don't... Reading that definition, I wouldn't know what to do with it. 3A. Disagreement in opinion. And the synonym is dissension. D-I-S-S-E-N-S-I-O-N. Uh, so, you know, the, um, the, the courts, like the Supreme Court, uh, they come up with a decision um, that's, that's what, they, what the decision is, is what goes. But the people who disagree, maybe there's like five of the uh, judges agree, so the majority rules, but then the other four, they have a dissent, a dissension, and that's the one that disagrees with the decision that was made. So there, there's, a, there's a difference there. 3B, an instance or cause of disagreement, as in, unable to settle their differences. Oh, maybe they need a mediator to come in and help them figure this out. It's okay to have differences to an extent. It depends on your situation. But, um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you need to... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? You know, you got to come together. Maybe you got to you got to say, "Okay, fine. You can have it your way. We won't be different anymore." 4. The degree or amount by which things differ in quantity or measure. Specifically, we have the 2B1 definition for the word remainder. So, yeah, this is what what's left over. What's the difference? If um, if I have six apples and you want five, I don't know why you want five apples. Are you going to eat all five apples right now? Uh, I give you five, and then the difference, the what's left over, is one apple that I will eat. Number five, a significant change in or effect on a situation. As in, it makes no difference to me. I don't care. There's no significant change in, in what happens to me. It's all good. It's all good by me. No difference to me. There's no etymology, but we do have very, one last, very last word. It's the second form of difference. Transitive verb from 1576. The synonyms are differentiate and distinguish. So, those uh, those are later. Differentiate, I think, is in the next episode, probably. Differentiate. Nope, the one after that. And uh, where was the... Distinguish. That's going to be a little while from now. Okay, let's reread the words. We had dietary, dietary, dietary law, dietary supplement, dietetic, dietetics, diether, diethylcarbamazine, diethyl ether, 
diethyl stilbestrol, diethyl zinc, dietitian diff, differ, or differ, difference, difference. Hmm, all right, let's see. Well, I'm thinking either difference or maybe, I don't know, dietary supplement. Those things are useful. You can't rely on them, but depending on your situation, they might be good. I guess I'll pick dietary supplement as the word of the episode. I take some dietary supplements. I do, I do. I take some B12 and calcium and then some other things sometimes. Dietary supplements, dietary supplements. That's it. I'm done. Thank you very much for listening to this podcast and this show. Don't forget to rate and review and share and subscribe and tell people about it and all those things. And uh, Patreon, merchandise, any of the ways to give me some money is fine by me. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. This is my podcast. I'm Spencer. I'm reading the whole dictionary. At least that's the goal. Let's do it. One more episode. This one will be one more in the bank, and it will be. I'll be that much closer to finishing my goal. The first word in this episode is different. How many ways you can say this? Different, different. Two syllables or three syllables. D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. First form, adjective from the 14th century. We have, we have many definitions. We have synonym information and usage information. Ooh, boy. This is, uh, yeah, is going to take up a good chunk of the episode. I think it's going to be a long one. Okay, number one for the first form of different. Partly or totally unlike in nature, form, or quality. And the synonym is dissimilar. Dissimilar. There's two S's in there. And they're, they're not quite similar. They're different. Uh, maybe completely different. As in, could hardly be more different. Could hardly be more different. They are so different, they could hardly be any more different than they already are. Um, this is often you uh, often followed by the words from, than, with an A, or in uh, the chiefly British areas, the word to, T-O, as in small, neat hand, very different from the captain's tottery characters. That is a quote from R.L. Stevenson. Oh, that must have been, uh, oh, what was that, Treasure Island, possibly? Or the Swiss Family Robinson? I think it might be more like Treasure Island. Um, So that was the first example with the word from. Small, neat hand, very different from the captain's tottery characters. The next example is vastly different in size than it was 25 years ago. Vastly different in size than than it was 25 years ago. So 25 years ago, it was one size, and now it is another size. What could we be talking about? A zucchini? Maybe it's changed in size in 25 years. That is a quote from N. M. Pusey. Here's another quote. A very different situation to the one under which we live. A very different situation to the one under which we live. That is a quote from Sir Winston Churchill. Is he the one who said, oh, I'm not even going to try. Okay, so we had two, I guess, American English examples with from and than, and then the third one was the British example, which uh, was followed by to, a very different situation to the one under which we live. So, you know, it's a cultural thing to... Which which word do you use after the word different? Different from, different than, different to. That was a lot more information than I was expecting. But yeah, things that are things that are not like each other are different. Hmm. Hmm. Um, let's talk about number two for different. Not the same as. As to a, the synonym is distinct. As in different age groups. 
they are not the same. They are different age groups. One age group is 18 to 34, and the other age group is 35 to 82. They're very different. To be, the synonym is various, as in different members of the class. So they may not be different types of people. They might be similar types, but they might be different. It doesn't really matter. They're, but they are part of the same group, and uh, they're just they're just people people in the group, and they're different people. <laughs> Helpful, right? Uh, to see the synonym is another, as in switched to a different TV program. So again, they might not they might be similar TV programs. They could both be reality shows, uh, but they're just uh, it's just another one. It's just different than the one that you were watching before. Number three, the synonym is unusual and special. Two synonyms, unusual and special, as in, she was different and superior. Wow, we went, some, went from a sort of objective to kind of subjective. Not only was she different from the other people, but she was superior to them. She was better than them, and everybody knew it. Uh, maybe this podcast is different from other podcasts. Differentness is a noun. Two things, two people, they will have some differentness between them. What? How much differentness is there? Uh, let's see. The etymology, there's really not that much. It's been a little while since I recorded the previous episode, which had difference, and uh, that didn't have a whole lot of etymology. Differ had the most. Um, and so, yeah, I think this is just similar to that. To postpone, to be different. Yeah. Here is the synonym information for different. Different, diverse, divergent, disparate, and various mean unlike in kind or character. All of those, in some way, the things that, are, that they're describing are unlike in kind or character. Different may imply little more than separateness, but it may also imply contrast or contrariness, as in different foods. One food, another food, they're different foods. Diverse implies both distinctness and marked contrast, as in such diverse interests as dancing and football. Yes, those are both very distinct and quite... Uh, it's hard to compare dancing and football. I'm sure that somebody will and can compare them and find similarities, but overall, they are quite different. The people who do each of them are have very different body types and possibly personality types. Um, and then also the things that dancers and footballers do are just physically quite different, quite diverse. Uh, I think I have a, f maybe not terribly diverse interests, but I have a variety. I have various interests. Divergent implies movement away from each other and unlikelihood of ultimate meeting or reconciliation, as in went, went on to pursue divergent careers. Uh, so movement away from each other. So maybe it's two people who grew up and they had a lot of similarities when they were young, uh, but they had interests that took them in divergent areas. One of them went and studied this, and the other one went and studied that. Maybe one of them studied cars, and the other one studied film. And divergent careers, but, you know, they, they, that, that doesn't mean that they, they're not still best friends or, uh, you know, just still like each other. It, they, they just have different interests. They divergent away from each other. Disparate emphasizes incongruity or incompatibility, as in disparate notions of freedom. Hmm. They're incompatible, incongruous. So these notions of freedom, they can't really, you can't really have both of them together. You gotta, it's kind of one or the other because they, they, they're not compatible with each other. And the final synonym, various. 
stresses the number of sorts or kinds, as in tried various methods. All, all the different ones, all the different methods of things. And here is the usage information for the word different. Numerous commentators have condemned... I feel like I should do this in a voice of some kind. I don't know what kind of voice. Let's see what comes out. Numerous commentators <laughs> have commended... No, have condemned. That's quite different. Numerous commentators have condemned different than in spite of its use since the 17th century by many of the best-known names in English literature. It is nevertheless standard and is even recommended in many handbooks when followed by a clause, because insisting on the word from in such instances often produces clumsy or wordy formulations. Different from, the generally safe choice, is more common, especially when it is followed by a noun or pronoun. Different from a book. Different from Spencer? Uh, or different than another thing. Hmm, that was, that was, it's always good to see the usage information. Um, uh, just a little, a little thing, a little uh, shout out to a future episode. I just recorded one that's going to air in, I think, about eight, seven or eight days. And it also had use some usage information, which uh, we don't we don't see it too often. But I'm glad that we found some other ones. Uh, and that episode I recorded with a guest, which is why I recorded it so far in advance. And uh, it's a good one. It's a good one. It's the one that's airing on December 29th, and we talk about some very adult subjects. So look out for that. This is the first time we're getting to a sound effect. So it's going to be aww. Ee-ee. The next word is the second form of the word different adverb from 1744, and it's just the synonym differently. Now, this is interesting to me because I often, I, I interchange these, and I think in my mind, I thought differently was more correct. But uh, yeah, different is good too. Different is good. So uh, don't get all mad at me if I say different instead of differently. I do say both of those quite often, I think. The next word is differentia. So it's the word different with an I-A added to the end. Differentia. Noun from 1551. The plural is differentiae or differentiae. Because we added an E after the A. T-I-A-E. Differentia is an element, feature, or factor that distinguishes one entity, state, or class from another. Especially, a characteristic trait distinguishing a species from another species of the same genus. So, what is the thing that distinguishes one thing from another thing? Um, so let's see, uh, I, w I don't know my, my species, my classes, my orders, uh, I don't know them enough, but basically, yeah, if we look at like species to species, um, let's see, ooh, I'm trying to think, dog and cat, I mean, those are different species, like dog and wolf, okay, uh, those are technically different species, and there is going to be a differentia characteristic, an element, a feature, a factor that distinguishes how dogs are different from wolves. So, I mean, one thing is size. Wolves are quite a lot larger than most dogs. Uh, I'm sure there's other things, you know, just the way they look physically. And uh, that's, that's a good, it's just a thing that differentiates them from another. How many ways, how many times can I say the same thing over and over again? The next word, bo wee wee, differential, first form, adjective from 1647, 1A, of relating to or constituting a difference, and the synonym is distinguishing. Consti what constitutes difference? It's distinguishing things. It's a differential. 1B, 
making a distinction between individuals or classes. 1c. Based on or resulting from a differential. It's sometimes hard to think about how these words are used in context if they don't give an example. Um, but, you know, knowing that some of these are adjectives or nouns, that helps. Um, but uh, I don't remember where I was going with that exactly. This one is specifically adjective, so it's describing a thing. 1D, functioning or proceeding differently or at a different rate. And yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say about these. That's just the way it goes sometimes. It's just about being different. Number two, for differential, being, relating to, or involving a differential or differentiation. And that's going to be in the next episode, that word, differentiation. 3A, relating to quantitative differences. Relating to quantitative differences. So I guess those would be differences that are, have to do with numbers, right? You can quantify them. There's four apples and seven bananas. 3B, producing effects by reason of quantitative differences. So, because of the differences that can be measured in number, uh, there are some, some things that happen because of that, I guess. <laughs> Differentially is an adverb. <laughs> this second form of differential is a noun from 1704, 1a, the product of the derivative of a function of one variable by the increment of the independent variable. And that seems to be related to math and numbers, and I wonder if all the rest of these definitions will be as well. Um, 1b, a sum of products in which each product consists of a partial derivative of a given function of several variables multiplied by the corresponding increment and which contains as many products as there are independent variables in the function. Quite a long definition. Number two, a difference between comparable individuals or classes, as in a price differential. So what is this difference between comparable individuals? So if uh, maybe if a car is being sold in maybe one area of the world that um, has maybe makes more money, they're going to charge one price for that car, but then maybe they're going to sell the same car in another place that maybe doesn't make so much money, and they're going to maybe charge less. So there's a price differential between those sort of class areas. I think that works. Also, for number two, the amount of such a difference. So just the difference between the numbers is also called the differential. And the fact that there is a differential is the differential. 3A, a drivetrain gear assembly, a drivetrain gear assembly connecting two collinear shafts or axles and permitting one shaft to revolve faster than the other. And this is, and the, the example is uh, in the rear wheels of an automobile. And I don't know my car things, so let's see. It has to do with the gears. There's two. There's two shafts. Maybe they're next to each other. Shafts or axles, and they allow they allow one to go around the other faster. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I need to see a picture of this. Three B, a case covering such an assembly. So the assembly of those pieces is called the differential. And then just the thing that covers them is also the differential. It's a whole differential thing. Uh, that's it for that one. The next word. <laughs> differential calculus. Two words. Noun from 1702. This, uh, this one freaks me out a little bit. I know we're not going to get to learn what it is exactly, but we'll get the basis, the high level. It is a branch of mathematics concerned chiefly with the study of the rate of change of functions with respect to their variables, especially through the use of derivatives and differentials. 
And yeah, that's, I don't know what we're talking about here. It's just the the rate of change. Okay, so it's how something changes. They probably use this in physics and astronomy and other things. Um, so yeah, based on various variables and derivatives and differentials, there's a rate of change and you use differential calculus to figure it out. Maybe you can use this thing as well. No, maybe not. Wah, 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 wah. Wah, wah. Differential diagnosis. And this is actually our last word for the episode. It's two words. Noun from circa 1860. The distinguishing of a disease or condition from others presenting with similar signs and symptoms. So you got two people who have similar signs and symptoms, but they have different diseases or conditions. And so, you know, you're using differential diagnosis to figure out what are the differences exactly? Who has what and why? And yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's it. I don't got nothing else to say about that. I feel like with as long as this text is for this episode it should have been a much longer episode but i like i said i just didn't really have a whole lot to say about these things i don't think there is a lot to say unless you know differential calculus or differential drive trains or other ways differential is used in math it's just about being different and unique and i like the different and unique things so today we had different different differentia, differential, differential, differential calculus, and differential diagnosis. Hmm, is one of these just more exciting than the other ones? I mean, I think different is pretty good. You can use it in a lot of ways. You can use it for things that are not at all like each other. You can use it for things that are mm, similar but not the same or things that could potentially be similar or the same, but are just not each other. Um, yeah, so uh, let's pick different. It's good to be different. Be yourself, be different from the other people. Be yourself, be yourself, be different from the other people. Don't do what they do, do what you do. Be different, be different, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was fine. Nice short episode. A, b- a beautiful song. I give it a 16 out of 4. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to this episode of The Dictionary. Uh, I hope I hope that you are loving this show so much that you, you decide to rate it, give it all the stars that are uh, available to you, Go ahead and write a review. Share this on all the social media, all the different ways that you can possibly think of to share this podcast. Go ahead and do that. Feel free to tag me at DictionaryPod on Instagram and Twitter, at Spijampar, also on Instagram and Twitter. You can use that same handle on YouTube and TikTok. The only TikTok videos I have are Dictionary Podcast related, so go check out those. And uh, let's see, what else? What are the other things that I have to say? Uh, Patreon, $1 a month, $5 a month. Those will get you early episodes. $5 gets you exclusives. Uh, So go do that. Go join the Patreon. You can watch this on YouTube. You can buy merchandise for this show at TeePublic. The link is in the show notes. You can call the Google Voice number, 917-727-5757. Leave a message. You can email me, dictionarypod at gmail.com. And uh, Jonah and Tom have made the wonderful theme songs. Maybe we'll have more in the future. Go ahead and make one if you want to make one. If you got some musical talent, or if you have no talent, and you just want to give it a shot, do that. If you've wanted to make music, now is your chance. This is your excuse. Mm, yep, I think that's that's pretty good for all those pluggy things. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just, you know, rate and review, share, subscribe, bell, all those things. The first word in this episode is differential equation. Two words, 
noun from 1763, an equation containing differentials or derivatives of functions. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yep. Yep. I, I never studied this stuff. And even if I did, I don't think I would remember it. It says compare to partial differential equation. So it's only part of it. The sound effect after this each word is going to be, huh? Because I don't know what a differential equation is. Differential gear is next. G-E-A-R. This is two words. Noun from circa 1859. The synonym is the 3A definition for differential which was in the previous episode, which was a drivetrain gear assembly connecting two collinear shafts or axles and permitting one shaft to revolve faster than the other. Differential gear. The next word. Huh? Differential geometry. Two words, noun from circa 1909. So we had differential calculus, In the previous episode, here we have differential geometry. I feel like my brain would understand this one better. It is a branch of mathematics using calculus. Oh, great. Using calculus to study the geometric properties of curves and surfaces. I don't even know. How do they, what do they use this for exactly? You know, if if you're ever really confused about how mathematicians figure a thing out, it's probably with calculus. I think that's pretty pretty good chance. Uh, yeah, at least that's how I view it, because I know enough about algebra and geometry and even a little bit of tr- trigonometry. But things, things past that, like what was that movie, Don't Look Up, they were figuring out the trajectory and the speed and the location of the asteroid coming in, and they were. I was like, what kind of math are they doing? I think it's calculus. I don't know if it's differential calculus, but it's probably calculus. Maybe we should put a link in the show notes for differential geometry if you want to go learn about that, and we'll do the same for differential calculus in the previous episode. Huh. The next word is differentiate. Verb from 1816, starting with transitive. One, to obtain the mathematical derivative of. To obtain. So if you're trying to figure out the mathematical derivative of a thing, maybe you should do some differentiating, and then you can figure it out. Two, to mark or show a difference in, and then also constitute a difference that distinguishes. To mark or show a difference, when you're showing the difference between things, you are differentiating, you are discussing about how they are different, Uh, Or you're constituting a difference that distinguishes. The difference that distinguishes two things is, uh, it's, that's also differentiating. Three, to develop differential characteristics in. That's differentiate, to develop. Oh, so if you're, if you're creating different characters in a thing, maybe two animal species, you're differentiating the, uh, now, it's probably not so much creating the differences it maybe it's more figuring out what the differences are or uh something like that differentiating the 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 the, the differences the differentials between two species you're differentiating the, the species from each other four to cause differentiation of in the course of development to cause differentiation so you're developing a thing and maybe you want some make you want it to be different in some way to another thing. You have to differentiate it from that other thing. Mm, what are you developing? Maybe you're developing a movie and you want it to be not so similar to other movies that have been made. You got to differentiate your movies. Otherwise, we get the same movies over and over again. 5. To express the specific distinguishing quality of and the synonym is discriminate. So, expressing the specific... Dis- so, if you're talking about the specific ways that things are different from each other, you are differentiating them, similar to previous ones that we've had here. 
discriminate is the synonym and that word that's going to be an interesting thing to talk about when we get there because there's the the idea of discriminating against a a, per, a person or a group of people but then also it's just the general idea of uh l- talking about how they're different so there's there's the connotations behind those uses of that word here are the intransitive verb def- definitions for differentiate one to recognize or give expression to a difference. Yeah, recognize the differences of things. Differentiate. Two, to become distinct or different in character. To become distinct in your character. Different from what you were before or different from something else. Three, to undergo differentiation differentiability differentiability that is a noun and differentiable differentiable that is an adjective mm, yep no etymology a lot of these have not had any on any any etymology because i think it all goes back to the word differ that's where it was there are many many forms of this word ways that you can use differ and it just expand on that. The next word. Huh? Differentiation. Noun from 1802. One. The act or process of differentiating. Two. Development from the one to the many, the simple to the complex, or the homogeneous to the heterogeneous. Okay. So developing thing from one to a, to a lot of things is differentiation because it's, I don't know, being split. It's being changed. Also, the development of the simple to the complex is differentiation or the homogeneous, which is things that are the same, to the heterogeneous, which is things that are different. 3A, modification of body parts for performance or particular functions. That's differentiation? Well, how, what, what sort of modification of body parts are we talking about? And for what reasons? I mean, obviously, people get piercings and many, many other types of things. I talked about the, the tongue splitting. And sometimes people put, you know, things under their skin to make a part raised, maybe like horns. People get their teeth Uh, filed down to points maybe they do things to their eyes maybe they oh so many plastic surgery lots and lots of forms of that so is that differentiation you are trying to differentiate yourself from what you used to be hmm but it's for performance or particular functions so there are reasons why you're doing this for performance or functions i don't know what i don't know what uh this specific thing would be on your body 3b the sum of the processes whereby apparently indifferent or unspecialized cells, tissues, and structures attain their adult form and function. The sum of the processes. Okay. And apparently indifferent or unspecialized cells, they attain their adult form and function. I'm sort of trying to put all this in my head because it's just... it's. It's worded very simply, which can make it sometimes complex. Um, Yeah, well, let's just move on. Number four, the processes by which various rock types are produced from a common magma. Ah, Okay, we're talking about rocks. So the magma comes from the volcano and it creates rock, but depending on maybe where the different rock areas are or what um what conditions they're under they might turn into different rock types and so that is a differentiation Mm -hmm. okay oh my my brain is overflowing the next word (sighs) differently differently or differently adverb from the 14th century We had, uh, this was the synonym in the previous episode just for the word different, so either one of those is fine. 
But what is it? One, in a different manner. This thing is different from that thing. It's doing things in a different way, so it's differently. They're being done differently. They're spelled differently. They're pronounced differently. I'm just thinking about words here because that's the context that I've got. Number two, the synonym is otherwise. Otherwise, in, in, this, in this other way, it's different from that way, so it's differently. What? 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 Differently abled is next. Now, this is two words. Differently abled, A-B-L-E-D, adjective from 1981. The synonyms are probably not... I don't think people try to use these words anymore, um, which is why differently abled was coined. Uh, So the synonyms are disabled and challenged. And it says compared just to the word abled. So mm, how do we... So, okay. So I think disabled... We don't really like that word because it sort of means that you are not abled. And that's not the case at all. Uh, It's better to say differently abled because you're still able to do things just different from the quote-unquote normal people, the abled people. For instance, the people who can walk opposed to the people who can't walk with their legs. But they can do other things um, and maybe sometimes they can do things better. For instance, people who are uh, who can't see, who are blind, it's not that they're disabled. It's not that they can't do things. Maybe they can't see, but they sure can hear better than somebody who is not blind. That's probably true. And then challenged. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's like, oh, it's a challenge for them to do things. Not necessarily. I mean, depending on the context, it might take some more effort to do a thing. But um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think they probably like challenged. Uh, so yeah, differently abled. Um, this th- We've been seeing a lot of change in, uh, obviously, the, the words that we use for uh, groups of people who are differently abled. Um, There was the ADA, what was it, the American Disabilities Act, which I think was maybe in the 70s um, when that got federally created where, you know, businesses or places are required to to make things accessible to all people. Um, So, for instance, ramps instead of or in addition to stairs, uh, making sure that bathrooms are accessible to everybody. The list goes on and on making sure that there's braille for people who can't see, uh, maybe captions of some kind for people who can't hear or something like that, maybe uh, f- uh, fire alarms. In, in addition to the the sound, there should be light so people who can't hear can still know that a fire alarm is going off. And so these are all things that uh, have been implemented or should be implemented for people who are differently abled. If you wear glasses you are differently abled than other people. I'm wearing glasses. I did finally get my eye exam done. Whew, thank God, I'm waiting for my glasses about two weeks till I get some new glasses. All right, the next word. Wait, 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 wait. Difficile. Difficile. D-I-F-F-I-C-I-L-E. Adjective from... 1536. These synonyms are stubborn and unreasonable. Difficile. This is French, and it literally means difficult. Are you being difficult? Are you a three-year-old who is quite stubborn and unreasonable and difficult? Quit being difficile. It's why. It's what reason do you have to be difficile? Maybe don't be difficile. We don't like it. Don't be stubborn. You know, it depends on the context. Maybe sometimes it's good to be difficult and difficile and stubborn and unreasonable. Although unreasonable and stubborn, yeah, those can be, surely can be different. Uh, There's also a Spanish word that is, I think, very pronounced very similarly, difficile. I think this second syllable might be emphasized, and I don't believe there's an E at the end. 
But uh, yeah, I think that's it's the same word. I think it's difficult. Why the French one is in here? I'm not entirely sure why. Do we do we use this French word in English? Hmm. Hmm hmm hmm. I don't believe I am particularly difficile. The next word, huh? Difficult. Here's the word, the English word, difficult. Adjective from the 14th century. One, hard to do, make or carry out. The synonym is arduous, as in a difficult climb. Maybe trying to get up a mountain could be a difficult climb. It's hard to do it, hard to make the climb, hard to carry out the act of climbing. Oh, I've seen some video of people climbing and I just don't understand how a lot of them do it. 2A, hard to deal with, manage, or overcome, as in a difficult child. I think most most childs are difficult at some point. Very hard to deal with, hard to manage. They like to cry and do things their own way. And it's very hard to overcome that. 2B, hard to understand, as uh, the synonym, puzzling. As in, difficult reading. I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes reading this dictionary is difficult because sometimes the definitions just don't make any sense to my brain. I like things that are more literal. I don't think I don't like things that are uh, more esoteric or metaphorical. Not that the definitions here are metaphorical per se. It's just that they're worded in ways that make it more complicated and difficult for my brain to understand like we had some in the last episode that were kind of like that all right difficult uh there's another synonym for the whole thing which is the word hard hard like maybe if you're doing sudoku or crossword puzzles or some other puzzling things there's easy medium and hard and hard is difficult but it's a simpler word to understand than difficult, maybe for some people. It's the same idea. D- the climb, the rock climb, is very hard. Oh, that it's, it's very difficult. Difficultly is an adverb. Do it in a difficult way. Uh, oh, well, actually, no, oh, that's different. Okay, so difficultly is an adverb. This word difficult is a back formation from the word difficulty difficulty which is what our next word difficulty i don't know if i've heard this one hmm okay it is a noun from the 14th century number one the quality or state of being difficult this just difficulty hmm i'm really trying to think if I've heard this used difficulty. I mean, it makes sense, I guess, but okay. Number two, the synonyms are controversy and disagreement. Controversy and disagreement. We are, we are having a difficulty. Number three, the synonym is objection. For some reason, this word just sounds really funny to me. It's just difficult with a Y at the end. It's like it's not it's like it's not a finished word for something difficult the synonym is impediment number 5 the synonyms are embarrassment and trouble and this is usually used in plural which would be difficulties difficulties well that one makes more sense we're having some difficulties here uh Houston we are having some difficulties with the machine and all the buttons in front of me. I don't know which buttons are which. Please help. This is from anything in anything interesting from the Latin difficilis, which means not easy. Oh, see, that's where there that's where this word is from. Dis plus facilis, which means easy, and there's more of the word facile. So it's literally just not easy. Dis became diff with two Fs, 
or actually one F, because the second F is from facilis or fisilis. So uh, yeah, it's just not easy, difficult. That's where this word comes from. And it's interesting also that difficult came from difficulty. Uh, but they're both from the 14th century. But difficult came from difficulty, which then, of course, came from dis facilis. That's fascinating. It, so does that mean difficulty came first and then difficult? We use difficult way more often, I think. The next word. What happened? Diffidence. Diffidence. Noun from the 14th century. The quality or state of being diffident, which is what? Our next word, diffident. Diffident or diffident. Adjective from the 15th century, one. Hesitant in acting or speaking through lack of self-confidence. Hmm, I, I have definitely been diffident at times throughout my life. I don't feel like I have uh, the self-confidence at certain times. For instance, maybe in uh, school, elementary school, junior high, high school, whenever, it doesn't really matter. Maybe I wanted to say something or ask a question, but I didn't feel confident enough to say it, so I didn't. I was hesitant in acting. Diffident. That's a good word to know. Number two is archaic. The synonym is distrustful. Distrustful about what? Yourself? It's archaic, so who knows? Three synonyms are reserved and assertive. No, unassertive. Reserved and unassertive. So you're just more, mm, you're into yourself, you are reserved, you're not particularly extroverted, maybe you're more introverted. Unassertive mean that you are not going to assert yourself. Maybe if the restaurant brought you the wrong food and you're feeling diffident, you are not going to say something. Uh, to you know, you're like, I don't want to make a scene. Yeah, I, I can definitely be a diffident person. Synonym is the word shy. Yep, that makes sense. Diffidently is an adverb. This is from the Latin verb diffidere, which means to distrust. So yeah, this archaic one, number two, distrustful, uh, that's the original way it seems like this was used. Uh, Diffidere is from dis plus fidere, which means to trust. And there's more at the word bide, B-I-D-E. So how did it become distrustful? And then it went to things that are about being shy, reserved, unassertive, lack of self-confidence. Hmm, that's an interesting evolution right there. Not sure if there's anything more to it than that. There must have been some some connecting point. The next word. (laughs) Diffract. All right, we're getting into a whole new section here. D I F. F-R-A-C-T, diffract. Transitive verb from 1803, to cause to undergo diffraction. You want to know about that? All right, fine, I'll tell you. What? The next word is diffraction. Noun from 19, no, 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 1671. We got one long definition. A modification which light undergoes especially in passing by the edges of opaque bodies or through narrow openings and in which the rays appear to be deflected. Also, a similar modification of other waves. And examples of those would be sound waves or of moving particles. And examples of those would be electrons. Okay, there's a lot going on here. Real quick, the etymology, it is from the Latin differingere, which means to break apart, which is from dis plus frangere, which means to break. So adding the dis means it's breaking apart, which seems like it's the same thing to me. There's more of the word break. So we we see this mostly with light. Um, if you shine a light through a prism, 
or maybe through a certain part of glass, or like it said, a narrow opening. So if you have a real small hole and you shine a light through it, the light is going to break apart into pieces, and you're going to see the rainbow of colors, probably. Um, like, like I'm trying to think, uh, sometimes if you look at like uh, the sh- where the shadow and the light meet, maybe on your floor or on your wall, at the very edge where the shadow and the light meet there, you might see some rainbow going on. And so that's where the light is kind of refracting a bit. No, diffracting. What did I say? Refracting? Is that the opposite? Um, But also, sound waves and electrons can also diffract. They can break apart. I don't know so much about those exactly, especially not the electrons. Uh, But yeah, any sort of wavy thing energy thing, I guess, can probably be diffracted. And of course, there is the famous um, Dark Side of the Moon Pink Floyd album cover that has the light, the prism, and then it's being diffracted into the the rainbow of colors. Well, see, now I'm really curious about the word refract. Uh, Let's see if we can find that real quick. We're actually pretty close. Now, I feel like it would be the opposite, but I feel like it's also the same. And it doesn't say here for diffract. It doesn't mention refract in any way. Hmm. All right. We are, we're getting real close. We're in the thousands pages, over 1,000. Refract, refract. Um, let's see. It. Oh, I think it's... Okay, it's similar to diffract, but it looks like from this little image that it's, there's, in addition to it breaking apart, it's also bouncing. It's also bouncing back. So that's, I think, where the the difference is. Yeah, reflecting, refracting. All right, so it's more about bouncing the, the energy, the waves, than breaking it up. Okay, that was good. The last word. <laughs> Diffraction grating. Two words. Grating is spelled G-R-A-T-I-N-G. This is a noun from 1867, and the synonym is the number three definition for the word grating. Clearly, this episode is a lot longer than the last episode. In addition to me having more things to say in this episode about these words... Um, I think a big difference was in the last one, there was a whole bunch of big sections of just reading, and that took up a lot of space. So, yeah, okay. So the words that we had in this episode, they were goodies. We had differential equation, differential gear, differential geometry, differentiate, differentiation, differently, differently abled, difficile, difficult, Difficulty. Difficulty. See, it does sound like I've heard this word. Oh, we, it's, yes, of course I've heard this word. Oh, that's, we're having some difficulty. It doesn't have to be plural. But it, I don't, for some reason, it just sounds so out of context. When you hear a word out of context, it doesn't sound right. Anyway, the rest of the words. Diffidence, diffident, diffract, diffraction, and diffraction grading. Well, I uh, I appreciate the word diffident. Um, I didn't really know the definition of that one, and I, I strongly connect to it. But I am going to pick differently abled as the word words of the episode because, uh, because, 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 how am I supposed to put this into words? Um, th- there, a lot of people have negative connotations to people who uh, might look different or physically be different than them. Uh, maybe they're in a wheelchair or maybe whatever, whatever it is, uh, there is there is absolutely no difference to these people um, other than just what maybe physically they got going on. And you, you got to look at who they are what their personality is, how do they treat others, what's going on in their brain, their mind, what do they know, all those other things. You know, you you can listen to the audio of a person 
and you would never know unless there's maybe some sort of uh, speech thing. You would never know if they're differently abled. So you got to respect your differently abled people and just know that they can do whatever you can and maybe better. And, you know, uh, I, I don't know. There's I've listened to a number of podcast episodes. I think the one uh, Short Waves, uh, they have done a number of episodes about people who are differently abled and with them. They are guests on the show. And we just need to make sure that we, we don't forget the differently abled people when we're talking about race and gender and sexual identity and age and religion and all those things you got to make sure that you fit in differently abled with that group uh with with all the groups literally just everybody and differently abled people are easily um uh easily forgotten easily uh i don't know you know you know what i'm saying you get it differently abled people are able differently. I don't have any other words to say because I'm afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing, which is really easy for me to do. All right. I think that is a fine place to end this long episode. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that you are enjoying the show, as I've said a zillion friggin' times. And go ahead and share it and subscribe it and do all those things and let the people know about this show of somebody who's trying to get through the whole dictionary. Uh, let's see. Do I have anything else to say? Oh, I saw some movies. No, why are we making this episode longer? I got things to do. So do you. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Oh, yes. Every single day, these episodes are coming to your your ear holes, places... Uh, let's see, what do I gotta say? What do I gotta say? My name is Spencer. How are you doing? How are you doing today, my word nerds? All right, should we just talk about the words? Yeah, sure, let's find you. Let's do that. What? What do we have today? What fun words will we be chatting about? Will I chat about with myself? The first word is diffractometer. Diffractometer. D-I-F-F-R-A-C-T-O-M-E-T-E-R. Diffractometer. Noun from circa 1909. So in the previous episode, we had diffract and diffraction. So the diffractometer is an instrument for analyzing the structure of a usually crystalline substance from the scattering pattern produced when a beam of radiation or particles, as x-rays or neutrons, strikes it. Uh, ooh, interest. this is very interesting. Diffractometric. Diffractometric, that is an adjective, and diffractometry, that is a noun, that is the... The, the study, the science of studying the diffracting and diffractometric. How, how, what's the diffractometric reading on that crystalline substance? So, yeah, this is pretty cool. Um, it's, it's, you're, you're figuring out with this instrument what's going on on the inside of this crystal, basically. So, based on the way that the light or, or the particles, the x-rays, the neutrons, how those things strike it, and you can see how then the, the pieces are broken apart and what pattern they make, what direction they go, um, what, what angle they go from the crystal. I don't know if they, they would check the speed. They might check the speed, actually, because the crystal might slow it down, slow down the speed of how it's going. So, yeah, based on all those things, they can they can figure out a lot of how the substance this crystal is made, uh, what's going on, how hard is it. I don't even know all the things that they can figure out, but it's pretty fascinating. Uh, okay, yeah, maybe we'll put a link in the show notes. The sound effect today shall be... The next word is diffuse. This is the first form and it has a slightly different pronunciation than the next word. I, I won't even tell you what it is. You'll find out soon. So, diffuse, first form, 
adjective from the 15th century. One, being at once verbose and ill-organized. Being at once verbose and ill. So is that you're both things at the same time, verbose and ill-organized? That is entirely possible. It would be more strange if you were verbose and silent at the same time. But uh, I think I, I might be a little bit of this ill-organized when I'm talking, when I'm going through this. I, I can be a little ill-organized, and uh, but I can also be verbose. So there's a lot of talking and not necessarily in an organized way. I know other people like this. Um, there's an example. Maybe we'll understand it a bit better. A diffuse report from the scene of the earthquake. All right. So it's the report was not well organized. It's ill organized. And there's a lot of words in the report. So it is verbose. Um, I guess I guess that's diffuse. I don't know. Something, something's very strange about this, this one in my brain. Number two, not concentrated or localized not concentrated or localized, uh, as in diffuse lighting, also as in diffuse sclerosis, diffuse sclerosis. So many S sounds. So let's see, what a, like a gas. A gas is not going to be um, focused or localized in one place. That's the whole thing about a gas is that it expands and it fills the container that it's in. So gases are kind of just automatically diffuse. Diffuse lighting. So this is light that like when the sun is shining down on a sunny, sunny day with no clouds, the shadows that it creates are very hard. Uh, they're not soft shadows. So that is not diffuse lighting. Diffuse lighting in the case of the sun is if you got a whole bunch of clouds in the sky and the sun is shining down on them, that's going to be diffuse lighting because there's either going to be no shadows or very, very, very soft shadows. You could also create diffuse lighting in like photography and videography if you put a thing in front of the light, which is kind of like what the clouds are doing. It's, it's, uh, it's diffusing the light. That's a little, a little sneak into the next word. Um, there is a synonym for this first form of diffuse, which is the word wordy. So if it's if something is very wordy, it is diffuse. Diffusely is an adverb, and diffuseness is a noun. This is from the Latin verb defundere, which means to spread out. From dis plus fundere, which means to pour. Hmm. Yeah, I guess if you're pouring something on the ground, it will spread out, lay in a puddle. There's more at the word found, F-O-U-N-D. So, uh, yeah, when a thing, when, a, when your milk pours on the ground and it spreads out in a puddle, it's diffusing from its originally local, uh, centralized location. The next word. The second form of the same word, but this time it is pronounced diffuse. Diffuse with a Z sound because this is a verb from the 14th century starting with transitive 1A to pour out and permit or cause to spread freely. To pour out and you are allowing it to just spread freely wherever it goes. Just pour one out for your homie. 1B, the synonyms are extend and scatter. Scatter, scatter, scatter. If you're scatterbrained, then maybe all the thoughts in your head are diffused. 1C, to spread thinly or wastefully. Hmm, thinly or wastefully. Oh, so my first thought was spreading butter on your toast. And if I spread it thinly, I'm being very conservative in my use of butter. That is not wasteful. That is the opposite of wasteful. But yes, I guess there would be things that if you spread something thinly and you do it over a whole big area, that could be wasteful. I, I don't know what we're spreading, though. Two, to subject to diffusion, especially 
to break up and distribute by reflection. And the example of what we are distributing here is incident light. Incident light. So you are subjecting the light to diffusion. You are breaking it up. Uh, in this case, it says by reflection. I think there are other ways to do that, though. You just put a thing in front of it, and maybe it's technically being reflected, but it's more being sort of spread out. The intransitive definitions. Number one, to spread out or become transmitted, especially by contact. To spread out or become transmitted by contact. So if you touch a thing or something, it gets spread out. I don't know what that would be. Number two, to undergo diffusion is to diffuse. Diffusible is an adjective. Uh, let's see. The etymology isn't uh, helpful. Probably pretty similar to the first word, the first form anyway. The next word. Diffuse porous. Actually, it would be diffuse porous. This is two words with a hyphen, and porous is P-O-R-O-U-S. Adjective from circa 1902. Having vessels more or less evenly distributed throughout an annual ring and not varying greatly in size. And it says compared to ring porous. So I believe this seems like it is talking about a tree because they have annual rings and uh, they don't vary greatly in size. Vessels, more or less evenly distributed throughout an annual ring and not varying greatly in size. Hmm, all right. Yeah, I think we got to post a picture. No, uh, put a link in the show notes so you can learn more about what are we talking about exactly? Diffuse porous and ring porous which is probably kind of the opposite. But yeah, I wish that they would give just a few more words here so we knew what we were talking about. Is it trees? Tell me. Just say in italics at the beginning, trees, colon. Having vessels, blah, blah, blah. That's all I want. I want to know the context. Or maybe it's other things. Just some, some, something, something. The next word, Diffuser. Noun from circa 1679. One, one that diffuses as 1A, a device as a reflector for distributing the light of a lamp evenly. That's why you got lampshades. If you don't got a lampshade on your lamp, it's just gonna it's just gonna spread out some really kind of harsh lighting. But if you have a lampshade on it, ooh, then it gets all moody and diffused and warm and cozy. 1B, so 1, again, is one that diffuses as 1B, a screen of cloth or frosted glass for softening light as in photography. We use this all the time at my job. We, we don't always want the hard lighting, so we put diffusers. It could just be a piece of fabric. It could be a whole big, a big contraption that's in front of the light. Lots of lights use them in different ways. And then there's different levels. You know, you could, there's like a f different uh, uh, thicknesses. And so some are going to diffuse the light more. It's also going to cut down on the light if it's going to, if it's like a thicker material. So in that, yeah, there's just different levels of that. They are diffusers. You put them on lights, little lights, big lights, whatever lights you need. Let's see. Yeah, cloth usually, but also frosted glass. I don't know if I've ever used frosted glass, but yeah, it's going to provide a different, a different quality. 1C, a device as slats at different angles for deflecting air from an outlet in various directions. So, yeah, I believe this would be um, like your your vents for the air conditioning or the heater. Uh, you know, you could just let the air come up in the vent all by itself and just it's just going to go up. Or oftentimes they'll have the little slats. A lot of times those slats are facing in one direction. And then it's so it's all going to it's going to push all the air in one way. 
Uh, but maybe they have a little dial, and you could say, no, I want the air to go that way. Uh, same kind of thing in your car. The AC and the heat, they've got those slats that you can adjust and move around. But if you want it to be diffused in, in, in lots of directions, uh, what are we talking about here? Air, yep, deflecting air. If you want it, the, the air to be diffused in lots of directions, then you need slats that are at different angles. I don't know if I've ever seen one of these. They mu I must have at some point. Number two for diffuser. A device for reducing the velocity and increasing the static pressure of a fluid passing through a system. Uh, so let's see. Increase the static pressure of a fluid. I don't know so much about that, but yeah, I guess a diffuser is going to just reduce the speed that the fluid is going through the system. Okay, next word. Diffusion. Noun from the 14th century. One, the action of diffusing. Also, the state of being diffused. I feel very diffused right now. My arms are over there, and then my legs are over there, and my head's up all over here. I'm diffused. I, I'm in a state of diffusion. Number two, the synonyms are prolixity, P-R-O-L-I-X-I-T-Y, prolixity, and diffuseness. Diffuseness. Number three, A, the process, hoo hoo, get ready for this one, the process whereby particles of liquids, gases, or solids intermingle as the result of their spontaneous movement caused by thermal agitation and, and in dissolved substances move from a region of higher to one of lower concentration. Okay, let's let's look at this again and break down a little bit. The process where by particles, so we're talking about liquids, gases, and solids. They're intermingling with each other. Uh, let's see, and that they're th they've been thermally agitated. So you know maybe they're uh, getting warmer or maybe they're getting colder. Um, I believe, and in I'm just looking again. And dissolved substances move from a region of higher to one of lower concentration. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think, I guess if you are heating it up, then the particles are going to move faster and maybe more crazy. And then that's when it can turn into a gas. I don't know if I'm on the right track, but it makes sense in my brain. So I'm going to say it, uh, it turns into a gas and that's where it becomes less concentrated in one place and it's going to spread out. Uh, and so that is diffusion. That's the diffusion of, of liquids, gases. So it goes from solid to liquid to gas. And I hope I got that close enough. Yeah. Yeah, because because um, this goes back to actually the, the last word, diffuser. Uh, there are those things that you can plug into your wall. Uh, maybe there's a little, a little liquid thing and it will diffuse... Uh, as it gets warmed up, it will turn it into a gas and it will diffuse the smells, the molecules, the particles into the air. Same with little candly things or wax. It's going to melt and then it's going to be turned into a gas because it's being warmed up. It's It's got that thermal agitation. That's a good band name. Thermal agitation. You can have it. Credit me. Next is 3B1. Reflection of light by a rough reflecting surface. A rough reflecting surface. 3B2, transmission of light through a translucent material. And the synonym is scattering. So in 3B1, the light is being reflected. It bounces onto this rough reflecting surface and it bounces off in generally the same same kind of angle in the opposite direction but then 3b2 is where the light goes through the material it's not it's not a reflecting surface it's not opaque this one is translucent or transparent and so the light goes through it and then it probably gets scattered and diffracted 
on the other side. Okay, number four. The spread of light through a translucent... Nope, nope, nope. The spread of cultural elements from one area or group of people to others by contact. Hmm. Cultural elements. This is not like a disease. We saw that with COVID. That got spread. The COVID was diffused throughout the world very quickly. Uh, But this is cultural elements from one area or group of people to others by contact. So, uh, let's see. Well, you know, you can think more about maybe in a developing country or in in the older days where it was more uh, groups of people living in one area. We didn't have these big cities. And then they would go meet the other group. And then they would learn about what cultural things that did they do. And so then those elements get diffused out and spread out into the other cultures and groups. Number five, for diffusion. The softening of sharp outlines in a photographic image. If you just if you don't want the outlines to be so sharp and you want it to be softer, maybe blurred a little bit, you put some diffusion on there. It's going to look so pretty. Diffusional is an adjective. The next word. Diffusionist. Noun from 1893. An anthropologist who emphasizes the role of diffusion in the history of culture rather than independent invention or discovery. Diffusionism is a noun and diffusionist is an adjective. So this is talking about uh, what we just did, the, the number four definition for diffusion, which is about the cultural elements being spread from groups of people to groups of people. And so... The anthropologist who thinks that the history of culture, I guess, was, let's see, what? They emphasize the role of diffusion. So they're, they're saying that the role of diffusion in culture is what may be more important or more apparent. I don't know what exactly they're trying to say, but they are emphasizing it very strongly, opposed to the idea of independent invention or discovery. So those are the two kind of opposing views. Does a group of people create a thing, invent a thing, discover a thing on their own, or do they learn about it from another group? So I guess I guess they're saying uh, that that culture spreads more so by diffusion than by invention or discovery. I think that at a certain point, at least, I think that makes sense. Maybe now too. I don't know. But yeah, one person invents a thing and then it's going to be spread to the rest of the people. We see that. It's not like we're all independently inventing our own phones. Each country is making their own phones. To a degree, that's true. But it's more like one thing is made and then everybody else sort of takes it, takes it on. The next word is diffusive or Diffuse, diffusive, S or Z sound, diffusive. Adjective from 1614, tending to diffuse, and also characterized by diffusion, as in diffusive motion of atoms. And that's probably when the, when the atoms are diffuse, diffusing, uh, they're maybe being heated up, heated up, they're heating up, moving around, turning into a gas. Diffusively is an adverb. Diffusiveness is a noun. And diffuse, diffusivity, diffusivity is a noun. One more word for this episode. Uh, what is it? It is difunctional. Difunctional? Three syllables or difunctional, four syllables. D-I-F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N-A-L. Difunctional. Adjective from 1943. It is not the word dysfunctional. That's going to be later. This is difunctional. Of, relating to, or being a compound with two highly reactive sites in each molecule. 
Um, it's uh, so there's the two, the two highly reactive sites. That's where we get the dye prefix from. And functional, it's it's just very functional. It works. It does its job. It's very reactive. I don't know enough about this to say more than that. Okay, let's, should we, yes, let's do that. Reread the words. We had diffractometer, diffuse, diffuse, diffuse porous, diffuser, diffusion, diffusionist, diffusive, and difunctional. And that was the end of the DIF section, if you wanted to know. Okay, what are we going to do here? What, Which one are we going to pick as the word of the episode? Um, let's see. I mean, I think maybe my top contenders, I like the defractometer. I think that's an interesting thing. Uh, diffuse, just in general, is an interesting concept uh, that a lot of things do. Uh, let's see. What else? What else do we have? Diffuser. We have these in my house because my wife likes things to smell good because I live there. Um, because I make it stinky. That's what I'm trying to say. And then she needs to make it smell nice. Uh, let's see. Diffu diffusionist. I think that's an interesting idea, um, about, you know, studying the, the spread of, of culture. Oh, I don't know what to do. Let's just pick... Uh, let's pick diffractometer because it's a fun word. And it's a cool invention. And the diffractometer measures how things diffract when things go through crystals. It's the diffractometer. It's going to measure how... What is it? What does it measure? It's going to measure how x-ray spread through a crystal diffractometer yeah all right that is going to be the end of this episode we chugged right through it i hope you had a good time learning some things um i uh, have not spoken about uh, what what movies i have watched recently uh let's see i don't remember where i left off i should bring up my list we like to watch some movies we've been watching more tv shows recently um I think I mentioned Wakanda Forever. Ooh, I'll mention uh, Violent Night. Not a kid's movie. Um, it's a play, of course, on Silent Night. This is uh, this is the Christmas movie that just came out in 2022 where, oh, how do we describe this? Um, it's it's like, I, I, hate, I hate comparing movies to other movies, but sometimes it's just the best way to do it. It's like if Die Hard met Bad Santa met Home Alone. And I think that's all you need to know. And it is great fun and pretty violent. I mean, it's right there in the title. And uh, yeah, it's just a very fun Christmas movie. Um, I think that's good. And the kid is great and she makes some great stuff. All right, that's going to be the end of this episode. This has been Spencer diffusing his brain and dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. I am Spencer. I am reading this book in full, hopefully, for your enjoyment and education. And, uh, you know, I just read the words and the definitions, and then I talk about them in various ways, depending on the context. And sometimes there are guests. Uh, let's see, we had a guest recently. Uh, there will be, looking ahead, there will be a guest in a few episodes that I already recorded. Um, and you know, we're gonna, we're gonna make sure to have some more guests coming up. Okay. Uh, if, if you are of the, well, let's see, how do I want to say this? Today, the, 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 the day that this is airing is Christmas Eve. So happy Christmas Eve to you. Merry Christmas Eve. And also, if I'm gonna say that, I really should be talking about the other holidays as well. The, at least the, the couple of big ones that I'm aware of. So, uh, Hanukkah started here in 2022 on the 18th, and so I believe that makes today the seventh night of Hanukkah. I'm a little confused about the dates, but I think it might be the seventh night. And then, ooh, Kwanzaa starts in a couple of days. So in two days on the 26th, I will make sure to mention that as well. 
there's there's a lot of holidays during this holiday season. So I'm not going to get them all, but I'll try and get the big ones. Okay, so maybe when you're done listening to this, uh, you can uh, you can light your candles and sing the song and give the gifts, and then you can also uh, you know put out uh, what what is what is Santa and the reindeer like the the cookies and and the uh, the oat milk and the uh, the candy canes and the the carrots the carrots for the reindeer and. Make sure to put out the fire before you go to bed. If you have that, and if you don't have uh, those things, um, then you know what? You don't got to do nothing because Santa is cool with whatever as long as you're a good person. All right. The first word in this episode is dig. D-I-G. The first of the D-I-G words, which are going to go one, two, three... Three episodes plus, uh, plus you know, about half or two-thirds of another episode. Okay, dig. Verb from the 13th century. The past form is dug, D-U-G, and that's, that's good. Uh, this is a, uh, um, we're starting with transitive, 1A. To break up, turn, or loosen with an implement. And what exactly are you loosening up or breaking up or turning? You are doing that to earth, dirt, soil, the very, very important stuff on this planet, also called earth. Um, Digging. You're digging it up. What are you going to do when you dig it up? Are you digging a hole? Are you digging a ditch? Are you going to plant some things? What's going on in there? Do you want to look at what's down there? Do you want to dig a super big hole? You're not going to be able to dig to the other side of the earth. That's just not going to happen. 1B. To prepare the soil of. As in, dig a garden. Dig a garden. You're preparing. And yes, I did all read that correctly. 2A. To bring to the surface by digging, as in unearth, as in, uh, the synonym is unearth, as in dig potatoes. They, they are grown under the ground, under the surface of the ground, in the soil, and you have to unearth them. You have to re- retrieve them from the earth, bring them to the surface, dig them up. Potatoes, potatoes, they they are probably the best food in the world because you can make so many good things from them. To be, to bring to light or out of hiding, as in dig up facts. They're, the facts are like the potatoes. They're factatoes, and they want to be hidden. They like to be down there, not in the light, but you got to bring them up. What facts? Maybe this fact. Three. To hollow out or form by removing earth. And the synonym is excavate, as in dig a hole. Just dig a hole. Go go dig a hole. Mm, To hollow out or form by removing earth. You pick it up and you put it somewhere else. It's always got to go somewhere. In addition to digging a hole and excavating it, you are also creating a hill. You you are doing two things at once, potentially. Number four, to drive down so as to penetrate. The synonym is thrust. And I'm not sure what we're talking about here. Uh, number five, the synonyms are poke and prod. That's similar to four, kind of. I don't know, what what are we thrusting or penetrating to dig i mean if you if you put the um the uh the shovel into the ground it's going to penetrate the ground but i don't know if that's what we're talking about number six is slang we have a b and c six a is to pay attention to the synonym is notice as in dig that fancy hat dig it i dig that fancy hat Maybe I need a fancy hat. I noticed that fancy hat. I like that fancy hat. Uh, 6B, 
this synonym, we're still slang. This synonym is understand, as in, couldn't dig the medical jargon. I don't understand that medical jargon. Can you please talk to me in normal English and not use the jargon? I would sure would appreciate that, because I don't dig what you're saying. Number 6C is also slang. The synonyms are like and admire, as in, high school students dig short poetry. That is a quote from David Burmester, or Burmester. Like or admire, dig it so you can see a thing and dig it. You can like a thing and dig it. You can understand a thing and dig it. I Can we put these all into a sentence? I dig that. No, I don't think I can. I dig it. Uh, okay, we are on intransitive now. Number one, to turn up, loosen, or remove earth. Two, to work hard or laboriously. When you are digging, you are working hard. Three, to advance by or as if by removing or pushing aside material. You know, those are all related to different ones that we read in transitive. Is there any etymology? Not much. It's from the Middle English diggin. That's it. Okay, I have to do a sound effect because we are moving on to the next word. We're going to go... The second form of dig is a noun from 1797. Number 1A, the synonyms are thrust and poke, and I still don't know what we're talking about. A thrust and a poke is a dig. Hmm. 1B, and I would, this is what I was thinking of, like maybe this is what a thrust and a poke mean. 1B is a cutting remark, a dig, ooh, that cutting remark, it cut so deep, it dug into my soul, it hurt so bad, you made me cry, that cutting remark. Please don't leave any digs in the reviews. You can make, you can say nice things in the reviews, but maybe not, maybe no digs. But, you know, if you gotta, you can. It's fine. I don't care. That's a dig. Number two is plural. 2A is accommodations for living or working. Your digs. Where do you live? Why do we call it that? I don't know. There's no etymology. Your digs. That's where you live or work. 2B So I think this is still plural, digs, and it is chiefly British, and it is the 2B definition for the word lodging. So that's very, very similar to 2A, accommodations for living or working. It's just uh, just where you live. It's your digs. Three, an archaeological excavation site. Also, the excavation itself is also called the dig. The site is the dig, and the whole process, the whole thing that's happening is the dig. And I learned relatively recently that it's surprisingly cheap to fund an excavation. Maybe you're going to go dig for dinosaur bones or old houses or something, but um, it's shockingly not that expensive. Uh, I don't know the numbers. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes, but it's not in the millions It's in, like, the 10,000s. Yeah. So if you've got some money lying around and you want to help somebody go do an excavation, uh, because there's always people looking to do that, maybe you can help them fund it. The next word. The third form of dig is an abbreviation for the word digest, which we will come up to later this episode. The next word. Digamy, D-I-G-A-M-Y, noun from 1635, a second marriage after the termination of the first. I mean, I've heard of polygamy and monogamy, and there might be other ones, so I was thinking, is this somehow related to those? I wasn't sure. Digamy, I mean, it is and it isn't. This is from the Greek digamos, which means married to two people. Married to two people. That's where the, the D-I prefix is uh, means two. So, but see, what I don't know 
is that back in the olden Greek times, and also in the 1635 times in, in English, uh, were they talking about literally being married to two people, or was it married to one and then married to another later, which is what the definition says? I, I don't know. But I have to go with the more modern definition because that's the time that I'm living in. Um, and I guess, I guess my marriage to Sharon uh, for both of us would be a digamy because we were both married before and then got divorced. That first marriage was terminated, and um, and then we got married to each other, and uh, it's a, it's a, we got a digamy. Sharon, we got a digamy. It's a it's a it's a fun word that why don't why don't ever people use this. The next word, digastric, adjective from circa 1721. This is of relating to or being either of a pair of muscles that depress the lower jaw and raise the hyoid bone, the hyoid bone during swallowing. Digastric, huh, wait, it's an adjective, so it's, there are these pairs, pairs, it's a pair of muscles, so that's where the di prefix comes in. Uh, they push the lower jaw down and also raise the hyoid bone when you swallow. I'm just doing a swallow. So yeah, there's a bone kind of in your throat, I guess, that goes up, and then the jaw goes down, and these muscles are the things that are making all this happen. And, or, or anything that's related to those muscles is digastric. Are these, are they called digastric muscles? I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think, I don't know if it's these muscles or other ones in the area, but I think mine are not, not doing the job quite as they're supposed to do. They're not maybe as strong as they should be because if you've listened to some of my older episodes uh, I have a I have a bit of a swallowing issue that um, sometimes things get stuck. I've had a bunch of tests, or they just don't go down right away, or I don't know. But I hope it doesn't get worse, because that's going to suck. I don't know why it's happening, but hey. Come on, di- di- digastrics, do better. The next word. <laughs> Digenetic. Digenetic is next. Adjective from circa 1883. Of or relating to a subclass, digenia, of trematode worms in which sexual reproduction as an internal parasite of a vertebrate alternates with asexual reproduction in a mollusk. Okay. Uh... It's relating to these worms where sexual reproduction as an internal parasite of a... I don't know what the rest of this is saying. I it's I can't be that complicated. The, the sexual reproduction of an internal parasite of a vertebrate alternates with asexual reproduction in a mollusk. So there's something about going between sexual reproduction, which is where... Two, two things get together and make a new thing, or asexual reproduction, where one thing is one thing can make a new thing on its own. Uh, but then we're talking about worms and parasites and other vertebrates and mollusks, so I'm a little confused. I hope that's okay. The next word. Digerati. Digerati. D-I-G-E. R-A-T-I, noun from 1992, persons well-versed in computer use and technology. And I don't think this gets used anymore. It is 30 years old, this word. Um, It is from, the D-I-G is from digital, which of course is about sort of computer things and technology. And then the erati is from, like the word literati, which I guess, I mean, it's not, I, I don't know exactly what this prefix would be, but it's, you know, it says somebody who knows a lot about a thing. A didgerati. I want it to be related to didgeridoo, but it is not, sadly. Is there a digital didgeridoo? 
A digital didgeridoo. A digital didgeridoo. The next word. Uh, damn it. I tried to get the sound effect of my stomach growling, which is so good time. I hit the mic onto my shirt, which is why it made that bad sound. It's perfect timing because the next word is digest. Digest. Emphasis on the first syllable. First form. Noun from the 14th century. One. A summation or condensation of a body of information. So you're summing it up, condensing it down as 1A, a systematic compilation of legal rules, statutes, or decisions. You take it down to its basics, and it's a digest. Now, the stomach sound is more for the next word, but that's okay. It's kind of the same word, but not at all. 1B... So still summation or condensation of information. 1B, a periodical devoted to condensed versions of previously published articles. Yeah, same idea. They've been condensed down into a digest. 2, a product of digestion. Anything that comes from digestion is a digest. This information the, uh, the the published articles, the legal statutes, decisions, rules, they were they went through a process of digestion and became a digest. This is Middle English. It means systematic arrangement of laws. And then it is from Latin digerere, which means to arrange, distribute, or digest. And that is from dis plus gerere, which means to carry. Let's carry it over here and shrink it down. The next word. Ooh, I feel a stomach growl coming on. Ooh. Yeah. I might have to boost the volume of that. The next word is the second form of the same word, but here we pronounce it digest or just digest. Because this is a verb from the 14th century, my stomach is not, I mean, maybe it's digesting food, but it's more saying, dude, I'm getting hungry. I would like something to digest, please, and thank you. So we are going to start with transitive here. Number one, to distribute or arrange systematically, and the synonym is classify. You got to classify, put things away. Uh, so uh, di- you're, di- you're digesting them. Yeah. Two, to convert into absorbable form. And what are we converting? It's food, probably, more than likely. Converting food into a form that can be absorbed by the body, by the stomach, by the intestines, by the, all the other things that are in there. Oh, there it goes again. Good thing we're almost done. Number three for digest to take into the mind or memory, especially to assimilate mentally. Hmm. So any information that you are learning, you're going to maybe keep in your memory banks, um, something going in mentally into your mind, you are digesting it. All of the information that you have learned throughout your years has been digested into your brainy thing. 4A, to soften decompose or break down by heat and moisture or chemical action, as in DNA digested by restriction enzymes. The DNA has been softened, decomposed, broken down, and it was um, the enzymes, the restriction enzymes, did it by heat or moisture or chemical action. 4B, to extract soluble ingredients from by warming with a liquid. The scientists, they do this. I don't know how, or why, or what, or where, or when, but uh, they want to get the soluble ingredients from a thing, so they were, they're going to warm it up so they can get those soluble ingredients. Five, to compress into a short summary. So that's like, so you can digest into a digest. So what's the what's the most important information? Six 
is the number one definition for the word absorb, as in the capacity of the U.S. to digest immigrants. So the U.S. has a certain capacity to absorb immigrants into all of its cities. And uh, yeah, absorbing, digesting. We, we don't want to eat the immigrants. No, we're not digesting them in that way. We're bringing them in to into the U.S. or other countries. Uh, lots of countries are taking in immigrants or refugees. And then, are they getting softened or decomposed? No. That's, that's good. Are they being converted into absorbable form? No. They're just being spread out into other parts of the country. Here is intransitive number one, to digest food. It's one of my favorite pastimes. Two, to become digested. Oh no, I'm pizza. I'm being digested. Um, yep, yeah, that's that's good for digest, I think. If you have anything you want to say, you can let me know. Look in the show notes for all the ways to contact me. The next word. Forgot what it what my sound effect was. <laughs> Digester. Digester. The uh, pronunciation shows the letter J for jester, so you know how to say it. And now all I can think about is like, is two jesters or a, a jester eating food and digesting it? A d- d- digester. Hmm. Three. Uh, it's a noun. I don't know why I said three. Noun from 1614. One. One that digests or makes a digest. <laughs> You got to make sure you emphasize those words correctly. My stomach is a digester. Two, a vessel for digesting especially plant or animal materials. Ooh, what are we doing with these materials from plants or animals? What vessel are we putting them in? Uh, uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, not off the top of my head, but um, yeah, there are various things, I guess. Um, what are those things called? Venus fly traps. Those are digesters. Uh, it's all, it's all right up there in the thing. They, they trap a, a fly or some sort of living thing, and then they get digested all up in there with the, with the acids and the, the things. We're all digesters. Anything that consumes something is a digester. The next word. <laughs> Digestibility. Noun from 1741, the fitness of something for digestion. Is it fit for digestion? Is it very fit or not very fit to be digested? What is the digestibility? Rocks and sticks don't have much digestibility, but donuts do. Two, the percentage of a foodstuff taken into the digestive tract that is absorbed into the body. Uh, okay, so how much of the food is put into the... Di- well, where does the rest of the food go? Uh, the percentage of a foodstuff taken into the digestive tract that is absorbed into the body. I would... Where, but what's the... But if it's only 50%, what's with the other 50%? Is the rest of it not digestible? The next word? Or maybe it's just like how much is taken at a time. Okay, the next word. Digestible. Adjective from the 14th century. I should also say that digestibility and digestible have an I after the digest part. It's not an A, like sometimes digestible. It could be with an A. This is with an I. Okay, glad we got that out of the way. Digestible. I think I said adjective from the 14th century. This is capable of being digested. Then you can put it in your mouth and eat it. If it is not digestible, please, please don't put it in your body. The next word. Digestif. Digestif. D-I-G-E-S-T-I-F. Noun from... 1934, this is an alcoholic drink, as brandy or a liqueur, usually taken after a meal. 
I believe that they are often, um, often sweet, but maybe not necessarily. Yeah, brandy, I don't think that's particularly sweet. Um, this is a French word. It literally means digestive, uh, which we are going to talk about at the beginning of the next word. But um, basically, I guess it is something that either does help with digesting the food that you just ate after your meal, but I don't know if these things actually helped in the digestion or if they just, it was an excuse to drink some more alcohol. I could see it either way, to be perfectly honest. Digestif. It's a fun word to say. All right, we have one more word for this episode. <laughs> digestion. Digestion. Digest. Yep, that's it. It's just digestion. D I G E S T I O N. There is one definition and then there is an A and a B. So, digestion is the action, process, or power of digesting. As A, the process of making food absorbable by dissolving it and breaking it down into simpler chemical compounds that occurs in the living body chiefly through the action of enzymes secreted into the alimentary canal. Ho ho, the alimentary canal. So yeah, the enzymes, the things are going to break down the food that you have eaten, and hopefully it's food that is easily digestible, like things that grow from the ground are going to be more easily digestible than things that are processed, made by people, things like that. You know, the, the tastiest of things, the things that we want to eat might not be as digestible as the things that we should be eating, although if you make them correctly, the things that we should be eating can also be incredibly tasty. So that's digestion. Also B, the process in sewage treatment by which organic matter in sludge is decomposed by anaerobic bacteria with the release of a burnable mixture of gases. That probably does not smell good. You're processing the sludge in sewage. Hmm. Not what I wanted combined with eating food, but it is, it, it's, it's the right word. All right. I think it is time to reread the words. That's where we're at today. We had dig, 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 digamy, digastric, digenetic, uh, digerati, digest, digest, digester, digestibility, digestible, digestif, and digestion. Hmm. There were some good ones here. I liked digamy, digging a hole. Yeah. Uh, there's other, good, you know, just digesting in general. It's a good thing to do. I think in that vein, I'm going to pick digestion as the word of the episode because um, it's, it's just a good thing that your body does to eat the food. What you should be doing is eating the food that is easy to digest. Um, you also might want to think about the order of foods that you eat because, for instance, fruit, uh, that is going to digest very quickly. And if you eat it on an empty stomach, it's going to digest and move through your system pretty quickly. But if you eat it on top of things like pastas and breads and things that don't digest so quickly, then the fruit is just going to sit on top of there and get all gross and rotty and stinky and farty. And maybe you don't want that. So, you know, think about the order in which you're eating stuff and you want your system to run smoothly, your digestion system. But what I would like to do for the song is to sing the B definition because, because why not? I don't know how to sing it. Let's see what happens. The process in sewage treatment by which organic matter and sludge is decomposed by anaerobic bacteria with the release of a burnable mixture of gases. Oh, yeah. I told you this podcast was jazz. All right. Uh, that is the end of the wordy part of this episode. 
And uh, let's see, I mentioned a movie that I watched in the previous episode. I probably missed some other things, but a couple of nights ago, Sharon and I watched The Muppet Christmas Carol, which she had never seen. And I had seen, I think, once when it was out in theaters and had not seen it since. And we've been hearing um, uh, Brett, Brett Goldstein talk about that movie a lot on his podcast his movie podcast and so we were like you know what we should watch it and for us it's the holiday season and oh actually you know because it's christmas eve maybe uh, if you're listening to this when this is aired you should watch muppet christmas carol and uh yes it is very good it is uh it's the story of christmas carol with scrooge and all that and how he gets changed by the spirits the ghosts that uh, show him the past the present and the future And uh, it's got Michael Caine. But then, you know, of course, it's done in the Muppety way, which is very heartwarming and very silly and funny and smart and goofy. And it's got all all the good stuff. So, yes, highly recommend A Muppet Christmas Carol. That is going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to go eat some food and then digest it. And I think you should, too. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary. How are you all doing? I hope you're doing well. I hope you're sharing and subscribing to this podcast. Make sure to share it. Share, share it, and share it, and rate it, and review it. And look in the show notes if you want to contact me or something or find some other things related to this show or me social media all that stuff go look in the show notes all right the first word in this episode is the first form of the word digestive d-i-g-e-s-t-i-v-e this is the first form if i didn't say that noun from the 14th century It is an aid to digestion, especially of food. So what what might help you digest? Well, at the end of the previous episode, we had uh, digestif, which is a drink, an alcoholic drink that may or may not help in the digestion of food. What are other some other things? Well, water right off the bat. I can think of water. That is a good uh, digestive because it's going to help the food it's going to help soften it you got to chew up your food you got to drink the liquids particularly water water's the best thing so water is a good digestive i don't know of other things i think there's maybe there's there's other things i don't know what they are maybe we'll find a list of them in the in the that whole internet thing and i'll put a link in the show notes all right the sound effect will be Bzzz. The second form of digestive adjective from digestive is an adjective. It's from the 15th century. One, relating to or functioning in digestion, as in the digestive system. You're describing the system as being related to digestion. The system for digestion. The digestive system also is in digestive disorders that's when you got an issue with digesting things in your body maybe it's it's anywhere in your digestive system you might have a digestive disorder your stomach your colon your i guess maybe your kidneys would be part of that your uh your uh you know your your intestines your uh large intestine your small intestine I think they have better names than that. And, uh, you know, there's other there are other parts, too. Uh, what, like Crohn's and colitis? That might be a digestive disorder. There's another example, a third one. Digestive organs. I just listed some of them. Number two, having the power to cause or promote digestion, as in digestion enzymes. These are the things that your body creates, and when there's food that gets put into the digestive organ, the little enzymes come out, and they're like, "Ooh, oh my God, there's food. I'm going to go, and I'm going to eat that food, and I'm going to break it down, and then the body's going to do some stuff to it. Ooh, this is my favorite food. Ooh, this food. Ooh, I don't really like that food so much, but I'm still going to break it down for you. Let's go, food. Digestively is an adverb. 
Bzzz. The next word is digestive gland. Two words, noun from 1940. I assume that you could uh, call this one a digestive organ. Let's see. It is a gland secreting digestive enzymes. It's a digestive organ that secretes digestive enzymes, and it is the digestive gland. Where is this digestive gland? I don't think I've heard of one. Is this in the human body? Is it in a different thing? Uh, maybe we need to put a link in the show notes so we can find out. Where, where is you, digestive gland? Zzz. The next word is digger. D-I-G-G-E-R. Noun from the 15th century. 1A. One that digs is a digger. 1B. A tool or machine for digging. It is also one that digs. A digging tool, a digging machine. Us, us humans are so smart. We made a machine to do the hard work for us. Maybe when I'm really old, there will be robots doing all the work for us, and then they will take over. Okay, number two is capitalized, and ooh, okay. This is uh, good for all of us to learn. Um, okay, yeah, usually it's capitalized, and it is usually disparaging, uh, especially formerly. What does that mean? Formerly, like, fo no, that's formerly, like it used to be. A sp in the back in the day, not now, but maybe it is still disparaging. Let's just assume it's disparaging. I think that's the safe thing to do. So, uh, don't say this, for first and foremost. What is it? It is a North American Indian who dug roots for food. And the example of the American Indian would be, I don't know how to pronounce it, Paiute? P-A-I-U-T-E. Maybe that is the, the group, the tribe, the area of this North American Indian. So I guess they would, uh, they would eat roots for food and they would have to dig. And maybe, maybe the, the European folk, the white folk came around and saw them digging and disparagingly called them a digger. And, and they didn't like that. So, so don't do that. Don't say that. Um, okay, number three is also often capitalized. It is chiefly Australian and New Zealand. It does not say disparaging, so I guess this one is okay. And it is just an Australian or New Zealand soldier. Mm, okay. Um, hmm. I wonder why. Why are they called a digger? Maybe, maybe we need to find out some information on that. I did not expect there to be more than just one that digs or a tool or a machine that digs when I read Digger. Good to learn these things, especially these disparaging things. So if you hear it or maybe you, you, maybe, maybe you heard people say it and you didn't know what it was and you didn't know it was disparaging, now you know. The more you know. Bzzz. The next word is Digger Wasp. Two words. Noun from 1880, it is a burrowing wasp, especially any of numerous usually solitary wasps that dig nest burrows in the soil and provision them with insects or spiders paralyzed by stinging. The super family name of these digger wasps is Sphecoidea, S P H. E C O I D E A, Sphacoidea. Uh, there are some of these digger wasps uh, in my neighborhood. I have seen they um, they they make their little holes. Uh, at least what I've seen is sort of next to the sidewalk, just right there in the dirt nearby. I don't know. I don't know if there's a reason why they do it next to the sidewalk. I feel like it's always next to the sidewalk whenever I see it. Maybe because it's close to ants. Or something I don't know but uh, yeah they they make these pretty pretty good size holes I mean I don't know maybe the width of a dime or the uh, the diameter of a dime or something and uh, these are some some big old wasps and they they live underground we obviously have to post a picture 
of a digger wasp. And maybe we'll put a link in the show notes. I've been putting a lot more links recently. I just think you need as much information as you can get. Not that you can't look it up yourself. The next word. Bzzz. Diggings. D-I-G-G-I-N-G-S. Diggings. Noun from 1538. One, a place of excavating especially for ore, metals, or precious stones. Precious. Or... O-R-E, it's like like an oil, like a, that kind of thing. Uh, so the place where you are excavating for those things is the diggings. Number two, material dug out. So the stuff that has been excavated is the diggings. The diggings came from the diggings. Number three, A, the synonyms are quarters and premises. Like, where do you live? Where do you stay? Where do you do your things? 3B, chiefly British, and it is lodgings for a student, specifically a student. So similar to 3A, quarters and premises, but for a student. They're diggings. Uh, that, that adds on to, what did we have? I think in the last episode, there was the, the digs, your digs, your accommodations for living or working, so you could also say your diggings. Where do you excavate your personal ore, metals, or precious stones? The next word. Zzzz. Dight. D-I-G-H-T. Transitive verb from the 13th century. It is archaic, and the synonyms are dress and adorn. So the act of Putting on clothes was to dight. Dight. Hmm. Uh, where does this come from? It comes from Old English, dighton, which means to arrange or compose, like you are arranging the clothes on your body. And it is from the Latin dictare, which means to dictate or compose. Hmm. I want to hear this used in a sentence. Would it literally, could you literally just replace dress or adorn? Uh, this morning, I am going to dight myself um, so then I so that I can wear some clothes. Dight. Dight. Where, why, why don't we use this word anymore? Next. Bzzz. Dig in. Two words. Transitive verb from 1829. No, 27. I just wanted it to be 1829. One, to cover or incorporate by burying. Burying, like burying the bone, burying the body. As in, dig in compost. Dig in compost. So you are, I guess you are, are you digging into the compost to bury things or are you putting the compost are you digging into something else and putting the compost in that to cover or incorporate by burying? Hmm. Digging. Yeah, I don't know. It could go either way. I think, though, you are burying a thing under compost. That's what I would assume. Number two. Um, by the way, I should say this whole thing is a verb and we are starting with transitive. So the second definition for transitive is to establish In a dug defensive position, as in, the platoon was well dug in. They literally dug a thing so they could go hang out below the ground. I guess that's that. They, they, that, and that's, in this case, it was used in the past tense. They dug in. And you can dig in. Let's dig in to the intransitive definitions. One, To establish a defensive position, especially by digging trenches. Yep. Oh, war. War, especially back in the day. You gotta dig a trench. It's it's probably still a thing these days, too. You gotta dig a trench so you can hang out in it and hopefully not get shot or blown up. There is... What's that documentary? That, That World War I documentary from Peter Jackson. Oh... They will something, 
but anyway, oh, there's lots of footage of them uh, in in these trenches. They have dug themselves into these trenches. To A for dig in. To go resolutely to work. Dig, so I, is that resolutely like, like you don't really want to go? Oh, I guess I'll go to work. I, I'm digging in to work. Three, maybe because it feels like it's a work. It's digging is work. It takes a lot of effort to get yourself to go do a thing. To B, to begin eating. That's my favorite use of this one. Let's dig in after all the food has been put on the table, on the plate, in the dish, in the bowl, wherever it goes. Let's dig in and eat the food. But let's try and do it casually. Don't scarf your face so fast. Number three, to hold stubbornly to a position. No, I'm not going to move from here. You you can't make me. I'm like digging in my feet into the floor so you can't physically move me. But it's more of a metaphorical thing. It could be literally, but usually metaphorical. Number four, to scuff the ground for better footing while batting. And this is talking about baseball. So this is literally, you know, maybe your feet aren't going into the ground, but you are digging your shoes. Maybe they have the pokey things on the bottom so you can get a real good grip. Uh, So you're digging in so your feet don't slip when you go to swing the bat. There is a phrase, dig in one's heels, and it means to take or persist in an uncompromising position or attitude despite opposition. Uh, What? To take or persist in an uncompromising position or attitude. So this is kind of like number three, to hold stubbornly to a position, but this is more about not not a physical position. This is more about uh, your, your stance on a subject. You... If, and if people come at you, they say, wait, I think you're wrong. And you say, no, no, no. I'm going to dig in my heels and say even more so how I am not wrong. I think I'm right. So let's let's get my heels all dug in. The next word. Did we talk about dig in enough? I think we did. The next word. Zzz. Digit. Now, when I first read this, just before I hit record... Uh, it shows, uh, the, it, it breaks up the syllables. So it says D-I-G dot I-T. But when I read it, I thought it was two words. And I, in my brain, said, dig it. Like, ooh, man, do you dig it? Can you dig it? But it's not. It's digit. And then I was like, wow, there's a lot of definitions for dig it. But it's not. It's digit, digit. Noun from the 14th century. 1a, any of the Arabic numerals 1 to 9, and usually the symbol 0. Just basically those 10 numbers, they're digits. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1b, one of the elements that combine to form numbers in a system other than the decimal system. So I guess that means anything... To the left of the decimal is a digit. Does that mean that things to the right of the decimal are not digits? I don't fully understand that. Why are we not including the decimal system? Any of the elements? Well, those are just the numbers, the Arabic numbers, 0 through 9. Any of the Arabic... uh, One of the elements that combine to form numbers in a system. Yeah, it's it's the same thing. They're just the numbers. Don't think too hard about the digits. Two, a unit of length based on the breadth of a finger and equal in English measure to three quarters of an inch. This is, I don't think I've heard this unit of length. It's based on the breadth of a finger. So I guess that's like the width. Well, your finger is in three dimensions. So the length would be from like the knuckle to the end. And then maybe the width, which is the width and which is the breadth? I don't know, but it's about three quarters of an inch. Um, so where where was that? Uh, unit measure 
equal in English measure to three quarters of an inch, a digit. I wonder if that's why we talk about, um, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Number three, any of the divisions in which the limbs of most vertebrates terminate, which are typically five in number, but may be reduced, as in a horse, and which typically have a series of phalanges bearing a nail, claw, or hoof at the tip. And it says compare to the number one definition for the word finger and the 1A definition for the word toe. So I guess it's saying that the fingers and the toes are the digits. I mean, that's always what I thought. Um, the divisions in which the limbs of most vertebrates terminate, so that's where the end uh, five in number, yes, five in number, usually, you got five fingers and five toes on each hand or foot, most people do, most, many animals do, but some animals don't, like horses, they have, like elephants, they basically have one, although elephants, they do have multiple toenails, I think, and maybe there are some toes and digits inside of that big thing, but anyway, you get the picture. Some have one, some have two, three, four, five, maybe some have more than that. There's a lot of cats that have six. Um, and it says there's a series of phalanges. Now, that's what's, I think, a little confusing, is that it seems like the digits we're talking about are the fingers and toes, but the phalanges, are those also the fingers and toes? Are those something different? I don't know. Maybe maybe at some point I thought that the phalanges were the fingers and toes also. I don't know. It's very complicated, but it's not at all. Okay, so this is from the Latin digitus, which means finger or toe, perhaps akin to the Greek dikneni, which means to show. And there's more at the word diction. So why does finger and toe come from to show? I mean, show and toe rhyme, but I don't think that's it. Is it, it's the thing you use your fingers and toes to show things to other people? Or those are the things that are at the end of your arms, which you use a lot if you have them, and they are easily shown to the other people? I don't know. That's a little, a little odd. But, um, yeah, so... If we go back to number two, which is the unit of length, that's three quarters of an inch, it's based on the digit, the finger, so that's probably why they call it that. Uh, Maybe that was a more standard length than like an actual finger. I mean, some people have short fingers and some people have long fingers, so that's, but it's the same thing as hands. Hands are different size and they have, they used hand as a measurement of length too. Uh, so, um, yeah, digits. You, digits are helpful to grasp things and do things, and I like my digits. And uh, I, I don't know, what, do we have anything to say about digits? I don't know. I think my palm is very long relative to the digits. I think the digits are kind of short. I got short digits. Everybody's digits are different. Let's, should we post some pictures of hands and check out your digits? Post a picture of your hand and tag me and we can look at your digits. All right, that's enough about those those things. Let's move on to the next word. Bzzz. Digital. So we added an A-L adjective from circa 1656. One, of or relating to the fingers or toes as in digital dexterity. Are you good with your digits? Do you have the digital dexterity? You need to know context, though, because as we will see shortly, digital can mean other things, too. Number two, done with a finger, as in (laughs) a digital rectal examination. It's not, there's not a computer or an electronic thing that's examining the rectum. It's a finger. Hopefully it's got a glove on. That's all I gotta say. And also some some lube. If you gotta get your prostate checked, you're gonna get a digital rectal examination. I should probably go do that, actually. Number three, 
of relating to or using calculation by numerical methods or by discrete units. It's about the numbers, and as we saw in the previous word, the numbers are digits. But what we didn't figure out is, are the numbers based on, well, I was going to say, are they based on fingers and toes? And if you think about it, we have 10 we have 10 fingers, largely, there are a few exceptions, so is it literally just because there are 0 through 9, there's 10 numbers and 10 fingers, and that's why we call the numbers digits, because our fingers are digits? Could that be it? Is it that simple? It might be. Okay, next is number 4 for digital, of relating to or being data in the form of especially binary digits, as in digital images, also as in a digital readout. So it's just, it's a thing that's digital, which anything that is electronically digital is, uh, it's, all, it's all in binary, zeros and ones, and the combination of those create electronic things, which are different than analog things, which are physical in real life, opposed to electronic. There is an especially of relating to or employing digital communication signals, as in a digital broadcast. And yeah, it says compared to analog, the number two definition. So yeah, those are those are the opposites. Uh, you are probably listening to this in a digital format. Uh, I don't think... There is any way that this could be in an analog format. I am recording this digitally. Uh, I guess if it were to be pressed onto a vinyl, oh, that would be cool. If this were to be pressed on vinyl or a cassette tape or a, 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 a an eight-track cassette tape or one of those things or a wax cylinder, then it would be analog. It would go from digital to analog. Number five, providing a readout in numerical digits, as in a digital voltometer. A lot of things that we have these days, uh, just they have digital screens, which is great. Six, relating to an audio recording method in which sound, sound waves are, pre- are represented digitally so that in the recording wow and flutter are eliminated and background noise is reduced. Okay, yes. Uh, so yes, did recording audio digitally. That's what I was talking about. I don't know why they have audio specifically, and I don't see video, but that's okay. Um, it's all digital opposed to... Uh, oh, it recorded digitally on a magnetic tape. I don't understand what this says, though. So that in the recording, wow and flutter. What is wow in audio terms? I've never heard this before. I might have to look that up. So uh, wow and flutter are eliminated and there is less background noise. And uh, yeah, I mean, with digital technology, especially now, you could do, you could just, you have a whole lot more control over what you're recording and the quality and what you can do to it. It's, it's mind boggling what you can do. Seven, the synonym is just electronic, digital electronic, as in digital devices. Also, characterized by electronic and especially computerized technology. Digitally is an adverb. All right, just a couple more here, and wow, I talk a lot. Digital camera is next. Two words, noun from 1976. 1976. A camera that records images as digital data instead of on film. That was a long time ago for the first digital cameras. It took a little while for them to become the standard, but wow, they became the standard. A lot of people still probably don't like to use digital cameras, but uh, but you know it's uh, it's cheaper, it's easier, 
um, faster, um, and probably, probably more controllable. I think you can probably do a lot more with digital photography and video than you could with, with film. Film sure does have a, a look to it, but uh, it's hard to find any of that these days. I use digital cameras basically every day of my life. We got them on our phones. Sometimes I call my phone my camera because I don't use it as a phone much. All right, the last word. Bzzz. Digital computer. Two words. Noun from 1947. These days, when we think of a computer, we just automatically think it's digital. But... This is a computer that operates with numbers expressed directly as digits. And it says compare to analog computer and also hybrid computer. So an analog computer would be, first of all, the human that used to compute things. They were they, the computer. Um, also, probably uh, there were some old computers that had lots of gears and things that could uh, compute numbers more quickly than a human could, and it was all analog. There was no, like, electricity exactly. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, 1947. So this is, like, right after World War II, they were able to do make computers that, I guess, it's electronic, it's, it's digits, it's, I, I don't know, maybe we'll put a link in the show notes. All right, I have to reread the words so we can pick a word of the episode. We had digestive, digestive, digestive gland, digger, digger wasp, diggings, dite, dig in, digit, digital, digital camera, and digital computer. Who I'm thinking either between digital or I also kind of liked dig in. I don't know. What, 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 what am I thinking here? Um, yeah, maybe we'll just pick digital as the word of the episode. Uh, you know, especially from a photography standpoint, uh, you, there's, there's just, ooh, d- you, you can do so much with it. Um, yeah, do I have anything else to say about that? I've talked way too much, so we'll just go. Digital, 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 digital cameras are really great. All the things that we have in our lives are digital. Nothing is analog anymore. Digital. That's going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information in a digital audio recording. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Uh, Please... Please, please, please rate and review this show. If you love it, then you, it is your job to rate and review on Apple Podcasts and all the other places. Uh, what else? If you want to follow me on social media, the show is at DictionaryPod on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, there's a Facebook page, too, which is, I just think it's The Dictionary. Uh, my personal is at Speedjampar, where that is uh, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon. Go to Patreon and give me a little bit of money each month so you can get episodes early and there are some exclusives and when there is a guest, there is often a video portion as well uh, and that's great to see. You you will definitely be getting episodes early. If you, if you can't wait, if you can't wait, if you want to be cooler than your friends who also listen to this, then you really should join the Patreon. I am currently, I think, like eight days ahead, which is not as much as I would like to be, but it's fine, Uh, at least with episodes uh, posted. Um, Let's see. Yeah, YouTube. You can watch this on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. You can buy some merchandise at at TeePublic. The link is in the show notes. You can email me, dictionarypod at gmail.com. You can call the Google Voice number, 917-727-5757. Leave a message. Just say some things. Just say some stuff. And uh, what else? Thank you to Jonah and Tom who made the theme songs. You can make your own theme song and email it to me or send it to me in some way. Oh, what else? Feel free to tag me on uh, social media if you want to do that. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's fine for now. 
The first word in this episode is digital divide. Two words, noun from 1996. The economic, educational, and social inequalities between those who have computers and online access and those who do not. I wonder what the digital divide is like now in 2022 when I am recording this almost 30 years uh, after this, this phrase was coined. Yeah, that's right after the internet became very widely available to many people. Uh, but, you know, it was still in its very uh, early years, early days. And so there were still a lot of people who had no access to uh, computers and the online, the internet thing. So, but yeah, these days it's really probably hard to find anybody in the world who does not have access to those. They exist, but not a lot. The next word, oh, let's see, the sound effect is going to be vv. The next word is digitalin or digitalin. D I G I T A L I N. Noun from 1837, one, a white crystalline steroid glycoside, C36H56O14, obtained from seeds, especially of the common foxglove. Oh yeah, you know, just the common foxglove. No clue what that is. It's probably a plant. Uh, steroid glycoside. No idea what that means. Oh yeah, from the seeds of the common foxglove. So yeah, it's a plant. It's got to be. Number two, a mixture of the glycosides of digitalis. Uh, so let's learn about that. Vroom. Digitalis or digitalis. So the only thing that's different in the spelling uh, between this word digitalis and the last word digitalin is just the last letter. Noun from 1664, number one, the synonym is foxglove. So digitalin comes from digitalis. Two, oh, this is a long definition. The dried powdered leaf of the common foxglove that contains glycosides which act on the heart. So this is, we get to learn about what uh, digitalin does maybe. Um, okay, dried powdered leaf of the common foxglove that contains glycosides which act on the heart and that in a powerful cardiotonic serving especially, oh, I'm losing my place because it's such a big block of text, and that is a powerful cardiotonic serving especially to increase the force of myocardial contraction, broadly any of various cardiac glycosides that are constituents of digitalis or are derived from a related foxglove. And the species name for that related foxglove is digitalis lanata. And the examples of just the various cardiac glycosides are digitalin or digi, di, di, digoxin. Digoxin? Digoxin. I don't know how to say that word. It's like digi and toxin. Digox, digoxin. Um, okay, so so fox, foxglove is the digitalis, but then the leaf that has been dried and powdered of the foxglove looks like, yes, uh, that is also digitalis, and it, it has these glycosides, and they do some stuff to the heart. What do they do to the heart? Um, increase the force of myocardial contraction. So maybe they help the heart to pump uh, stronger, maybe if it's kind of weak, I guess. Uh, yeah, that, that, that would make sense to me. Maybe we'll put a link in the show notes for digitalis and digitalin. Okay, the next word. Zzz. Digitalization. Noun from circa 1882. The administration of digitalis, I was not expecting this, until the desired physiological adjustment is attained. And then also the bodily state so produced after, I guess this has been done, is digitalization. 
Okay, so I think the word I was thinking of, or the definition I was thinking of, is more for the next word. Uh, but I guess I thought that could have been the same thing. Digitalization is using digi digitalin and digitalis to help with the heart. The next word. Bzzz. Digitalize. I don't know why, but I like saying a lot of the words in this episode digital i don't know there's something very satisfying about the the way to say those digital digital and digitalis digitalization digitalize digitalize this is the first form it is a transitive verb from 1927 and it is to subject to digitalization so yep it's the same thing subjecting a body a heart to digitalis is digitalization or digitalize Ah, I see where we're going. Okay, the next word. V Digitalize, second form. Transitive verb from 1962. This synonym is digitize. This is kind of where my brain was going because I am not familiar with digitalis or digitalin, so digitalize and digitalization was not a concept in my head in that way with the steroid thing. Um... But making things digital, that's where my brain goes. So it's not digitalize or digitalization. I just like saying these words. It's digitize, which I should have known. Which, uh, yeah, we'll get to that in the later this episode. The next word. Digital subscriber line. Three words. Um... Okay, it's a noun from 1984. A high-speed communications connection used for accessing, 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 accessing the internet and carrying short-range transmissions over ordinary telephone lines. And it does not say this, but I am pretty sure that you can um, abbreviate this to DSL. Now let's quickly jump over to that page which is over here. Let's see. Let's just do a quick look. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I don't know why they would, wouldn't say it here. Oh, well. DSL. I think we hear that more often. What's your... Do we? How much do we use it these days? DSL. Do, what, do you have a DSL line? High-speed communications. That was definitely more of a thing a while ago. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Digital subscriber line is what it is. What it stands for. The next word. V Digital video disc. Three words. Noun from 1993. And the synonym is DVD. Watching. I'm going to watch my digital video disc. Um, it's not not words that are very common to what we, we don't. We don't say these words. We say DVD even now. When we use Blu-rays or streaming more than DVDs, we still say DVD all the time. Did do you watch it on DVD? For some reason, that has become the the standard for what we do. But we don't say digital video disc. I think we should. Blu-rays have finally taken over. Most mostly, there's still a lot of DVDs being sold, but they're cheap and they're not as good quality. And then, of course, streaming is very quickly taking over that as well. DVD, DVD, DVD. I still have a lot of DVDs. Ain't gonna get rid of them, probably. I do have a lot that I want to get rid of, though. The next word. Zzz. Digitate. Adjective from 1661. Having divisions arranged like those of a bird's foot. As in, digitate leaves. So these leaves, maybe there's, it's like, it's one leaf, but it's split maybe into three parts, and one goes to the left, and one goes to the right, and one goes straight out, kind of like a bird's foot. They got their, their digital, their toes, their claws, their talons, kind of in that shape. Hmm. So, um, oh, digitally, or digitately, digitately, or digi digitately, that's an adverb. And, uh, you know, it must be just because they're like, they're like the digits of a bird's foot. Digitate leaves. Next, 
Zzz. Digity. This is a prefix, D-I-G-I-T-I, and it means digit or finger, as in digitigrade. Digitigrade. So if you see that prefix, it's probably going to be related to the fingers or the toes or other digital things, but you know, you need you need to look at the context to see what what exactly it means. The next word is zzz, digitigrade, adjective from 1824. Somehow we know it's related to digit or finger, but how exactly? All right, this is walking on the digits with the posterior of the foot more or less raised. So that means walking on the digits. So if there there's some sort of animal that walks, that it is a digit a digitigrade because the back of the foot is raised more or less while it's walking. So it's mostly walking on its fingers or most of the, or toes, or the, the whatever the digits are of that animal. That's mostly what it's putting all of its weight on. So I do think we need to put a link in the show notes. Maybe even post a picture on social media of an example of a digitigrade. Because I don't know. I can't think of any. Maybe, I don't know. I sort of think of primates and apes. But depending on how they walk, I don't know. They're not, they're not specifically that. I don't know. I can't think of any. But I'm sure they're out there somewhere. Over the rainbow. The next word. Zzz. Digitize. I have done lots of digitizing in my day. This is a transitive verb from 1953. To convert as data or an image to digital form. Digitization is a noun and digitizer that is also a noun. I have been a digitizer doing digitization. Uh, yeah, so let's see. I mean, the first example of things that I do is uh, back in the day, if you record some video on a tape and then you put it into a machine that's connected to a computer and you record it onto the computer as it's playing, you're making a digital image of that. You are digitizing that footage. Um, if you are, If you scan a photo into the computer, you are making a digital version of it. You are digitizing it. Uh, recently, we sent off a bunch of old Super 8 film to a company to digitize it uh, so we, we could have easy access to all of these old home movies that we haven't seen for decades. And it's beautiful and gorgeous. And if you have them and if you have the money, because it is kind of expensive... Uh, if you can do it, I strongly recommend that you get your old film things digitized. It's also just safer because those things can are subject to water and fire and stuff. Um, maybe if I am able to have the time, I will show an example of... So we, we got some old footage, some old Super 8s digitized many years ago, but it went straight to VHS basically, which is a very crappy crappy uh, state of being um but then we redigitize them onto you know high quality and uh the, it just looks so much better so if, maybe if i can find a couple examples of before and after of that i'll show you the difference of what we can do these days people the next word Zzz. digitizing tablet noun from 1980, it is two words. The synonym is graphics tablet. And I think that this must be just those uh, those drawing tablets where you have a pen and you draw on the tablet, but it's all, it's, it's just another way to kind of use your mouse, but it's with a pen. And so you can make, it's easier to draw and write and it's all goes right into the computer. And so, you know, we call it a graphics tablet or a drawing tablet now, but... Back then in 1980, they called it a digitizing tablet because it was a tablet and it would digitize the things that you do with the pen, with your hand. But that's sort of an old term now, I guess. Uh, I have one of these 
and I use it. I don't use it for what it's supposed to be used for much these days, but I do still use it, um, you know, for, for drawing. I would do rotoscope animation, and so I would draw on this thing, and it's very, very helpful for that because you can't really draw with a mouse so good. You just, you just can't do it. The next word. Zzzz. Digitonin. And I apologize if I'm talking fast. I'm trying to slow down, but I also know that that's going to really extend the episodes out, so I'm trying to find a happy medium. Digitonin. Noun from 1875. It is a steroid saponin C56 H92 O29 occurring in the leaves and seeds of the common foxglove. The foxglove has returned. It's a steroid saponin saponin um so it's another another kind of steroid that comes from the foxglove. We had digitalin and now we have digitonin. And they have uh, very different chemical structures. Let's see. Digitalin has 36 carbon and digitonin has 56. Digitalin has 56 hydrogen. Digitonin has 92. Digitalin has 14 oxygen. And digitonin has 29. So it's almost has twice as many... A give or take twice as many of those those atoms. Wow. I don't know what it does. The next word. Zzzz. Digitotoxygen. Digit... No, I added a syllable. Digitoxygenin. Maybe I had less syllables. Digitoxygenin. D-I-G-I-T-O-X-I. G-E-N-I-N, noun from circa 1909. This is a steroid lactone, C23, H34, O4, obtained especially by hydrolysis of digitoxin. We haven't gotten there yet. It's from digitoxin. Should we talk about that? Okay. Zzz. Digitoxin, noun from circa 1883. And this is D-I-G-I-T-O-X-I-N. This is not the word that I had trouble with earlier, which was... I'm trying to find it. It uh, it didn't have as many letters as I was expecting. And I can't find it. It was like dig, digoxin. I think that's what it was. This is not that word. Digitoxin is a noun... I already said that. It is a poisonous cardiotonic glycoside C41 H64 O13 that is the most active constituent of digitalis which is foxglove also a mixture of digitalis glycosides consisting chiefly of digitoxin which is the word that we are talking about and then digitoxygenin is a steroid lactone obtained from hydrolysis of digitoxin. Oh, I, d- I just don't have anything to say about these because I don't know anything about this stuff. But that's fine. If you like it, go learn about it. The next word. Z- diglyceride. Diglyceride. Noun from 1918. An ester formed from glycerol by reacting two of its hydroxyl groups with fatty acids. And that is that. The next word. Zoop. Dignified. We are changing gears a whole lot for these last two words. Dignified. Adjective from 1584. Showing or expressing dignity. Uh, we're we're going to see dignity at the beginning of the next episode. And uh, di- but I'm not dignified. I just am not. And we will learn about dignity later so we can learn about what does that mean? What is dignity? What What is the proper definition of dignity? The next and last word for this episode. Dignify. D-I-G-N-I-F-Y. 
This is a transitive verb from the 15th century, one, to give distinction to, and the synonym is ennoble, E-N-N-O-B-L-E. So you are, you are making, making something, you, you have a lot of distinction. I'm trying to think of another word to use here instead. You're, you're giving it the props. You are saying how great it is. That's, that's a simple way to say that. Giving distinction to, dignify. Um, yes, it, it's um, very, um, it, is, it is deserving of your praise. If you are dignifying a thing, it is deserving of your praise. That's another way to say that. Number two, to confer dignity upon. Also, to give undue attention or status to, as in, won't dignify that remark with a reply. So, this is kind of, there's two different things going on here. So, on the one hand, dignify can be used to to say how great a thing is. But also, um, it can be used to say, you know, it's not worth, it's not worth that, uh, to give undue attention. It's not worth the, the praise, the greatness that you, that you say it is. Uh, I think, I think that's, that's fine for that. Won't dignify that remark. I guess you could dignify that remark and then you would say, but usually it's, it's, yeah, it's undue attention. It's not deserved. Uh, let's see, this is from the Latin dignus, which means worthy. So yeah, something, if something is worthy uh, of, of dignity, you can dignify it. I guess, I guess some people might think this podcast can be dignified, but it's not. It's just not. All right, that is this end thing. Oh, blah. That's the, that's the, the, the let's reread the words. Digital divide, digitalin, digitalis, digitalization, digitalize, digitalize, digital subscriber line, digital video disc, digitate, digita, digitagrade, digitize, digitizing tablet, digitonin, digitoxygenin, digitoxin, diglyceride, dignified, and dignify. Oh, this is hard. I, I like a digitizing tablet, although I guess I would call it a graphics tablet because I, I got those, I got it, and I like it, and I don't use it enough. Uh, digitize, ooh, that's a good one, uh, at least for me. You know, if you if you have a different word of the episode, why don't you pick one and uh, send it to me or share it on social media and tag me? I want to know what you think about anything. Uh, let's see. Any other ones that jumped out at me? Uh, I mean, you know, digital video disc DVD. I was working at a video store when they really started to become popular. A couple of video stores, actually. And so they have a special place in my heart, for sure. I remember, I think Austin Powers was one of the first DVDs I got. There were a few other ones. Um, but, you know, we haven't gotten to the actual DVD word. Did Nobody says digital video disc. Ooh, I think I might have to pick digitize as the word of the episode. Yeah. Let's digitize our old films. Go get your old movies and photos digitized. Because then they won't get burned up in a fire or flooded in the water. And you can save them and share them in a digital format. Digitize, digitize, digitize. Oh, this is this is just an excuse for me to be insane, and I like it, and I hope you like it too. That is the end of page 349, and then there's more tomorrow. Okay, this has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye! Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the Dictionary. It is the podcast where I am reading the Dictionary, and I, my name is Spencer. How are you doing? Thank you for joining me. Uh, Don't forget to share this podcast with everybody that you know and rate and review. The first word in this episode is dignitary. Dignitary, D-I-G-N-I-T-A-R-Y. Noun from 1603. 
One who possesses exalted rank or holds a position of dignity or honor. And we'll learn about dignity in the next word. If they have it, the dignity and the honor, and they have some, probably some power, and the people like them, hopefully, maybe, they've got a rank which is exalted. They are a dignitary. Dignitary is also an adjective. I feel like these are the people who go from one country to go to another country to talk about foreign relations or other other things, right? Th- that that seems that seems right. Yeah, I, I I don't know much about the politics stuff. The next word we're gonna do a sound effect, which is just gonna go. Beum. The next word is dignity. Noun from the 13th century, and in the last episode we had dignified and dignify, which is which is uh, seems to be related to dignity. Uh, yeah, dignified is showing or expressing dignity, which is number one, the quality or state of being worthy, honored, or esteemed. So if you have done a good thing, you're doing good things, people like you, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you. You have dignity. To a high rank, office, or position is dignity. That would be, you know, a dignitary has that sort of dignity. To be a legal title, a legal title of nobility or honor. So there's the title of dignitary, but I guess also dignity. That's a legal title. Hmm, haven't heard of that one. Number three is archaic, and the synonym is just dignitary. So I guess they used to be called dignities, but then they changed it to dignitaries, or just dignitary. And four is formal reserve or seriousness of manner, appearance, or language. Formal reserve, so you're very serious about your manner, your appearance, or your language. You're very proper. Um, You're you're just done up right. Your clothes are great. I, I do not have this kind of dignity whatsoever. As you clearly can tell from the words that I say on this podcast, and if you saw me, you would you would not think that I am serious in my appearance. I'm not a total schlub, but I'm kind of a schlub. I try try. I should be better. I should try better. Um, and then my your manner, yeah. If your if your hair is all nice and neat, your your facial hair, if you got that, that's that's dignity. You got a visual dignity about yourself. Hmm. Uh, the etymology is not. There's not a whole lot of information. Um, I think we could probably probably relate it to dignify. It's from the Latin dignus, which means worthy. Yeah. If you are worthy, you have dignity. I really prefer the the number one definition. The quality or state of being worthy, honored, or esteemed. We should all strive to have that kind of dignity. The next word. Do. Dig out. Two words. Um, It's a verb from the 14th century starting with transitive. Number one. The synonyms are find and unearth. What have you found in the earth? Let's dig it out and see what it is. Is it a bone? Is it a coin? Is it a toy? Number two, to make hollow by digging. So maybe a squirrel or a woodpecker or something is digging out part of a a tree or something. They're digging it out. They're hollowing it out and they're doing, they're digging. A dog might be digging in the sand make it hollow. We were just down at the beach yesterday and uh, there was all these dog tracks going all sorts of crazy directions and then every once in a while you'd see a little part where they clearly were digging. I was like, ooh, I feel like I feel like uh, Aragorn from Lord of the Rings when he's tracking the situation of the hobbits when they were with the orcs and there was the horses and they're, they were bound and it's like, okay, there was a dog and he went over here and then he was digging and then he got distracted and then he started digging over here. 
Uh, okay, so that is dig out. Here's intransitive for dig out, which is the number two A definition for the word take off. What are what are we taking off? Taking off clothes? Taking off in a plane? To what what else can be taken off? And how is that related to dig out? Hmm, that's a thinker. Boo. The next word is, uh, I think this was the word I was having trouble with uh, one or two episodes ago. It is pronounced either digoxin or digoxin. You can pronounce the G either way. D-I-G-O-X-I-N. Digoxin. Noun from circa 1930. It is a poisonous cardiotonic steroid, C41, H64, O14, obtained from a foxglove and used especially to treat atrial fibrillation. And the species name for foxglove is Digitalis lanata. And yes, I definitely remember reading about foxglove. Uh, Where was that exactly? It might have been more than a couple episodes ago. It was within the last week. So uh, yeah, digoxin. It's good. It helps your heart. Dio. The next word is digraph. Digraph. It's like the graph, the chart with the things and the numbers and the bars and the lines. And then we put the di prefix. So is it about two? Is it two things? Noun from 1780. One, a group of two successive letters whose phonetic value is a single sound as, uh, let's finish the thing first, a single sound, or whose value is not the sum of a value borne by each in other occurrences. All right, let's break this down. So the first part of the definition is about two letters next to each other whose whose uh, sound, whose the sound that you make when you make the sound is just one sound. So the example is the E-A in bread, it just sounds like eh. The e and the a eh becomes eh, bread. Or the ng in the word sing, you combine those to make one sound. Ng, the ng, ng. But then the second part is the value is not the sum of a value borne by each in other occurrences. So the examples here are the ch in chin where the value is T plus SH. What? Chin. So is it saying, I never heard of the sounds of letters being called the value. Uh, so I guess phonetically, the ch sound is made up of T and SH, but it's made up of CH in this context. That's, that's weird and confusing to me. Number two for digraph, a group of two successive letters. Just, just any two successive letters. Any two letters that are next to each other are a digraph. Technically, I don't know. Um, I think it's probably something more specific than that. Maybe we'll put a link in the show notes. Number three is the number four definition for the word ligature, which... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know enough about ligature to think of how that's connected to digraph. Digraphic is an adjective. It's about letters and sounds. Digraphically is an adverb. I missed that one. It was on the next line. The next, deup, digress, or just digress. Digress into madness This is an intransitive verb from 1529. To turn aside, especially from the main subject of attention or course of argument. And the synonym is the word swerve. We're talking about this over here, but whoa, let's swerve to this conversation, which I often do here. Sometimes I do, especially if there's a guest. We like to digress into tangents and other topics sometimes. Uh, let's see. This is from the Latin uh, the Latin verb digredi, 
which is from dis plus gradi, which means to step. And there's more at the word grade. So maybe it's about stepping, stepping aside, digress. Let's have a digression. What's that? It's a noun from the 14th century. One, the act or an instance of digressing in a discourse or other usually organized literary work. Uh, so you're talking about a thing. There's a literary work or something, but then yeah, the the act of the the, the digress when you digress to a thing, you're having a digression. Number two is archaic. A going aside. That's the whole definition. Just a going aside. Um, I guess if you're if you're going for a walk, if you're doing a thing, you're going aside. That is a digression. Digressional is an adjective. Digressionary is also an adjective. Hmm. I need I need a thing. I need something to spark me to digress. Well, let's see if we have one in this episode. The next word, do digressive. I guess you could also say digressive. Adjective from circa 1611, characterized by digressions, as in a digressive talk. So if you if you have lots of digressions while you're talking, while you're chatting with your friends, and then you can... It is very easy to have digressions. I was just having a conversation with a couple people last night, and there were so many things, and we kept on getting distracted. We we're like, wait, 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 we're getting off topic. Let's go back to this thing. There's, we have too many. I was like, I need to make a list. Let's, what's the list of the things that we want to talk about? Let's stay focused. Digressively is an adverb, and digressiveness is a noun. When you have more probably than two people, it's very, very easy to be digressive, have digressions in your conversations. It gets frustrating to me sometimes. The next word. So we had dig out. And what what else did we have in the previous episodes? We had dig. I think I remember CS. We had dig in. And here we have dig up. This is kind of like dig out. Not totally. Dig up. Transitive verb from the 14th century. The synonyms are find and unearth, which are the same synonyms for the number one definition for dig out. If you are finding a thing in the earth, let's dig it up. Out from the earth, up from gravity, up to your face to look at it. D-U. Next is dihedral. D-I-H-E-D-R-A-L. Noun from circa 1911. Number one, the synonym is dihedral angle, A-N-G-L-E, and there is a picture of a dihedral angle, so I guess, well, no, we're going to hold on to that for the next word. Let's just, just, just cool your jets, man. Number two for dihedral is the angle between an aircraft supporting surface, an aircraft supporting surface like a wing, and a horizontal transverse line. The angle between the aircraft supporting surface, so basically the angle from the wing of a plane and the horizontal transverse line. Is that the line that goes through the wing? Uh, I don't fully understand that, but maybe the next word will help us a little bit. Be dihedral angle. Two words, noun from 1826. A figure formed by two intersecting planes. Now, these, the, what makes this extra complicated is that these are not the planes flying through the air. These are the plane, the flat surfaces. So the picture shows one surface, let's, let's call it a tabletop, because that's kind of what it looks like. It's flat, it's horizontal to the ground. And then there's another surface that is cutting through the first one, or at least is coming up from the first one. So 
You know what a better example might be? Let's say it's a book, and then you lift one page. So this one page is kind of going up at an angle. The angle from the first one up to the second angle that's going up in the air, that is the dihedral angle. And any, you know, it could be anything from 0 to 180 degrees, or maybe 1 to 179 degrees. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I would need a visual to figure out how this is connected to the plane wing, to the horizontal line. I don't fully understand that, but um, it's a, it's a, it's the angle that's in three dimensions. That's what the I think this is kind of about dihedral angle. There's no etymology. Next, d u dihybrid, dihybrid, adjective from 1907, of relating to involving or being an individual or strain that is heterogeneous. No, 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 that's not the word. Heterozygous at two genetic loci or loci. I just saw the, the prefix of heterozygous and my brain just immediately assumed it was heterogeneous. My brain just assumed it was hetero, heterogeneous. I don't know. What did I say? Heterogeneous? So it's about a thing that is heterozygous at two genetic loci. Lo- locations. Dihybrid is a noun. Hmm. This I'm I'm having a a brain fart of heteros like two. Ge- I don't know. I think we have to put a link in the show notes to talk more about this because I'm curious, but I don't know enough about these words to give a good description. Something about it's a hybrid. The next word, be you. This is a prefix, dihydra or dihydro, and it means combined with two atoms of hydrogen, as in, di- well, it's our next word, dihydroergotamine, dihydroergotamine. Uh, so yeah, it's good. The, the two, two hydrogen atoms, if it's got that, it uses the di- dihydro, or you can take off the O prefix. The next word, biump, dihydroergotamine. I'm not going to spell it. It's basically spelled how it sounds. Noun from 1945, a hydrogenated derivative, C33, H, hydrogen, 37, N505, of ergotamine that is used in the treatment of migraine. And I assumed that there would be two hydrogen atoms, but there's 37. I don't know how this works. Let's talk about the next word. Be dihydrotestosterone. Testosterone. Noun from 1965, a biologically active metabolite, C19, H30, O2, of testosterone, having similar androgenic activity. Yeah, my brain doesn't know what to do with these things, these scientific chemical things. The next word is the last word. It is a prefix, which is dihydroxy. Dihydroxy. D-I-H-Y-D-R-O-X-Y. I think it's going to be about hydrogen and oxygen. And what is it? It is containing two hydroxyl groups. As in the example, which is going to be the first word in the next episode, which is dihydroxyacetone dihydroxyacetone okay okay so the words that we had in this episode were dignitary dignity dig out digoxin digraph digress digression digressive dig up dihedral dihedral angle dihybrid dihydro dihydroergotamine dihydrotestosterone and dihydroxy. Dihydroxy. I kind of think I just have to pick dignity as the word of the episode. I mean, I think it's just good to strive to have live a life that will will provide you with dignity. I just, why wouldn't you do that? Right? 
yeah, I guess. I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I mean, I did think digraph, the phonetic sound. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, there's a lot of those words that are about phonetics and sounds and how you use your mouth, which I think are really interesting, but I, I've never studied those. And uh, I don't know. It's, there's just a whole bunch of those words that I think are interesting. Um, yep, yep. Let's 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 stick with dignity. If you've got dignity, you are worthy, honored, or esteemed. That's a short little song. That's going to be the end of this episode. The beginning of page 350. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Yay! Woohoo! Cheers, cheers, cheers. Uh, hello, how are you doing? I'm Spencer. I'm reading the dictionary. I read all the words and the definitions and the things and I talk about them and I tell things from my, my brain and my personal life and I try to explain things in other ways. Maybe it helps you understand. And we have some fun with their sound effects and musical things sometimes. And it's just a grand old time. There will be a guest in tomorrow's episode. You know how I know? Because I already recorded it. Uh, it's a good one, uh, so I, I highly recommend come back tomorrow for the next episode and check it out, and then also go check out uh, Sarah's Sarah's business. If it sounds like something that you are interested in, you'll learn about that tomorrow. Uh, go go check it out. Check out all the things that she's got. Uh, let's see. Uh, and actually, we do reference we reference a few words at the end of this episode. I know sometimes this goes out of order a little bit, but but you are must you must listen to this in order. Go back to the beginning if you haven't. Start there. Follow the journey from beginning to end. Let's take this journey together. We are going to take a short little journey today, and it's starting with the word dihydroxyacetone. D i h y d r o x y a c e t o n e. This is the last of the D I H words. I don't know why, but I have uh, started a habit of telling you the first three letters and talking about that. And I didn't, I didn't do it in the last episode. We went from D I G to D I H. So this word, I'm not going to say it again. It's a noun from 1895. A glyceraldehyde isomer, C3H6O3, used especially to stain the skin to simulate a tan. Wait, is this literally just spray tan? Dihydroxyacetone? Hmm, interesting. Um, and it does, so if you look at the, uh, the chemical makeup, there's double the hydrogen to oxygen, H6O3, and I guess uh, in the previous episode, we had dihydroxy prefix, which is two hydroxyl groups. So I guess a hydroxyl group is probably, hmm, well, what, what would it be? Would it be H? No, it would be maybe one, maybe one. I don't, I don't really know. Something about double the H's to the O's. Double the H to the O. Here I go with my flow. That's as much as my brain can do. Okay, that was uh, actually the last D-I-H word. Here is one D-I-J word, and the sound effect is going to be, pardon me. That's the sound effect, but I have to finish the phrase. Do you have any Dijon mustard? That's not how the phrase goes, but some of you might know. How, how do you pronounce this? You can say Dijon Dijon or Dijon. That's the first word with a capital D I J A. No, O N. D I J. Oh my God, the letters are hard to say. D I J O N. And then the word mustard. Noun from 1938. It is a prepared mustard made from dark mustard seeds, white wine, and spices. I didn't know white wine was in there. It is from Dijon, France. Dijon. You have to say it Frenchy. Dijon, France. 
Um, I don't care for this mustard. I'm I'm a I'm an, a I'm a good American, and I like my yellow mustard. My my palate, my tasty palate, is not so defined. It's uh, it's not refined either. And so, I don't know, I just never really cared for this stuff. Maybe I should try it again. Maybe I'll appreciate it now. My tastes definitely have changed as I've gotten older, so let's let's give some Dijon mustard a try. And of course, when I was a kid, the, the f- most popular brand of Dijon mustard was Grey Poupon. And so there was that commercial. Pardon me, do you have any Grey Poupon? You could just, there was a time, I think I'm stealing this joke from somebody else, there was a time, it's not a joke, there was a time when people would just roll down their windows and say to random strangers, pardon me, do you have any gray poupon? The next word, pardon me. Uh, this is a fun word. I definitely chuckled the first time I heard it. It is dick dick. I think the first dick is emphasized. It is D-I-K hyphen D-I-K, noun from 1883, the plural is either just dick dick again or dick dicks. Any of a genus of small antelopes of eastern and southern Africa having an elongated snout. Its nose mouth region is elongated. And they're very small, these small little antelopes. The genus name is Madokwa. M-A-D-O-Q-U-A. Nobody knows where this name came from. I suspect that it is just from some Eastern or Southern African language. I don't know why they wouldn't know that. Um, Yeah, we'll definitely post a picture of a dick dick on social media. They're very cute little antelopes. The next word. Uh, Okay, that was the first D-I-K word. We got a few more. The next one. Pardon me? It is dyke, D-I-K-E. This is the first form, noun from the 13th century, one, an artificial watercourse. The synonym is ditch, D-I-T-C-H. So if you want the water to go a certain way, maybe you're, you're digging a ditch, you're digging a pathway in the dirt for the water to go. So you've made a dike, a water course. That makes me think of a, I don't know, a course? I don't know, something. Number 2A, a bank, usually of earth constructed to control or confine water. And the synonym is levy, L-E-V-E-E. It's like a dam. You set. You put up some earth, some dirt, some soil to stop the water from going in an area Um, And, uh, yeah, that's also a dike. To be a barrier preventing passage, especially of something undesirable. So we're not literally talking about water here. Uh, In in the 2A case, the water would be undesirable. Like around New Orleans, there's a bunch of levees because it's it's under sea level, right? Um, And so the water would be undesirable. We learned that from Hurricane Katrina. It was very undesirable to have all the water flooding everything and ruining everything and people dying, and that was a terrible catastrophe, to say the least. Um, But also, a dike could just be something that stops something that you don't want. 3A, a raised causeway. Mm, Would this be for cars? Probably for cars, but it's raised up. Maybe it's above the water. Maybe it's like a bridge or something. 3B, a tabular body of igneous rock that has been injected while molten with a fissure. Okay, so while this igneous rock was liquid, was molten, was very, very hot, this is like the stuff that comes out of the volcano, Uh, while it was liquid... It was injected into a fissure. So I guess that it would like a fissure would be like a crack in a rock that's already hard. And then this molten rock gets into that crack and then it solidifies. And so hmm, I feel like maybe we need to either put a link in the show notes for this rock version of Dyke 
or maybe post a picture uh, so we can see what it looks like. But yeah, maybe I don't I don't know what what it is or how it's used or something. The etymology for this first form of dyke says that it is probably from the Old Norse dyke, which means ditch, from Middle Lower Jatin, Middle Lower German <laughs> dyke, which means dam. So dam and ditch, akin to the Old English dyke with a C, which means ditch. And there's more at the word ditch. So that's that's generally where this comes from. The next word, pardon me, the second form of dyke. This is a transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to surround or protect with a dyke. It's the barrier, the thing that's stopping the water. Uh, what is that? There's the, the picture of the, there's, there's like that fable or whatever it is with the kid with the putting their finger in the dike to stop the water. It's a dam. It's basically just a dam, but I think they just called it a dike in that situation. So number two for the verb form of dike is to drain by a dike. So you are you can protect a thing with a dike from water, or I guess you could drain by a dike. So does that mean that if you put a little hole in the dike, then all the water drains out of the place i don't I'm not sure about that to drain by a dick or maybe maybe this is the one where you're building uh you're, you're constructing ditches and so you're draining a certain area by using a dike so you're you're telling the water where to go diker is a noun the one who's doing the diking the next word pardon me it's the third form of dike. This is a variation of what I... Some people would say it is a disparaging word, and some people would say that it is uh, maybe a term of endearment, or that maybe a word that they would use to describe themselves. It is dike, spelled D-Y-K-E, which will be one of the last words in the D section. You'll have to wait until we get there. The next word. This is the last D-I-K word pardon me? Dictat. Actually, you emphasize the second syllable, so it's dictat. It's just D-I-K-T-A-T, -T, noun from 1933. One, a harsh settlement unilaterally imposed, and the example is on a defeated nation. So, there's a war between two nations. One of them's defeated, and the the uh the winning nation i guess puts something on they impose a settlement on the one that they they defeated and it's very harsh it's a diktat number 2 the synonyms are decree and order that makes sense they have decreed that they are putting on this settlement they have it's it's been ordered um 1933 so this was before world war 2 after World War One, I, I wonder what the situation was where they decided to create this thing. Um, this is a German word, and it literally means something dictated. So they have dictated, they have said, we are going to impose this on you. So it's a diktat. Um, that's, that's kind of it. It's from the Latin dictare, which means to dictate. Next. Pardon me. It is the first D-I-L word. And it's an, an abbreviation. It's just DIL, abbreviation for dilute. Dilute, which is going to be in a couple episodes from now. Next. Pardon me. Dilantin. Capital D-I-L-A-N-T-I-N. It is a trademark, and it is used for... I don't know how to pronounce this... Phenytoin, P-H-E-N-Y-T-O-I-N, phenytoin, some sort of drug, I'm assuming, dilantin. Have you taken your dilantin today? The next word, pardon me, dilapidate. Dilapidate, this is a verb from 1565. We are starting with transitive Number one, to bring into a condition of decay 
or partial ruin, as in, furniture is dilapidated by use. And that is a quote from Janet Flanner, F-L-A-N-N-E-R, Flanner. Um, I think it's funny that it's worded to bring into a condition of decay. You are bringing it that way. You're doing some things uh, because it's a verb. You know, you, there's an action involved in in doing the decay. You use your furniture a lot. Maybe you're jumping on the bed, sitting on the couch for 30 years. Yeah, it's going to get dilapidated. Number two is archaic, and the synonym is squander. Squander. So if you're squandering a thing, you're dilapidating it. And we have one intransitive definition, which is to become dilapidated. The furniture is becoming dilapidated. The empty, abandoned building is becoming dilapidated because nobody lives there. Nobody is upkeeping it. It's just falling apart. Maybe there's vines and plants growing. I can't wait until all the humans are dead and everything becomes dilapidated. Dilapidation is a noun. This is from the Latin verb dilapidare, which means to squander or destroy. From dis plus lapidare, which means to pelt with stones. So, um, interesting. If you are pelting a thing with stones, um, it will become dilapidated. It will be destroyed piece by piece, little by little by little. Um, And then lapidare is from lapid or lapis, which means stone. Hmm. Never knew that dilapidate was from stone. I guess, hmm, yeah, that's interesting. And it's kind of funny because stones technically do become dilapidated over many, many years of uh, erosion, but it's a very, very slow process. One of the slowest processes in the, the whole world. Next. Pardon me. I want my Dijon mustard. Dilapidated is next. Adjective from 1565. Decayed, deteriorated, or fallen into partial ruin, especially through neglect or misuse. As in, a dilapidated old house. Let's fix it up. Let's make it nice so people can live in it and it's not so dilapidated. But they are, they do look very cool. Dilapidated houses. You just want some creepy family to live there and it's, you're in a horror movie. Ooh. Pardon me. Dilatancy. That's the next word. Dilatancy. Noun from 1565. Hmm. Same word, same year as the last word. Dilatancy is the property of being dilatant, which is, pardon me, the next word, dilatant. Adjective from 1885. Now, wait a minute. Dilatancy is the property of being dilatant, but that word didn't even exist in some form until 320 years later? That doesn't make any sense. There must have been, it must have been around. Huh. Okay. Dilatant is increasing in viscosity and setting to a solid as a result of deformation by expansion, pressure, or agitation. Increasing in viscosity and setting to a solid. So this is about, I guess, a liquid turning into a solid. Um, and there's, as a result of deformation by expansion, so so when it maybe becomes a solid, it expands, uh, like water to ice, or maybe pressure, if there's a lot of pressure on a thing, it's going to become a solid, um, or agitation, if it's agitated in some way. Hmm. I think we need to put a link in the show notes for dilatant, uh, so we can, we can learn more about it. I would assume that this is mostly about rocks and things like that. Um, hmm, yeah. And then if a thing has been been through this process, then it is, uh, maybe it has dilatancy. How would you 
use that in context. I'm not sure. Maybe the next word is related. Pardon me. Pardon me. Dilatation or dilatation. Noun from the 14th century. One, amplification in writing or speech. Amplification? Well, I guess if you can, you can, while you're speaking, you can be amplified with a microphone, but I don't know how you would amplify writing. Number 2A, the condition of being stretched beyond normal dimensions, especially as a result of overwork, disease, or abnormal relaxation, as in dilatation of the heart, also dilatation of the stomach. So I think, yeah, this is about being dilated, which we're going to talk more about that soon. Um, so yeah, being stretched out, like when your when your eyeballs dilate, the black part gets bigger. It's being the you know the iris, the colored part is being str- kind of stretched out. Um, hmm, maybe that wasn't the best explanation, but uh, yeah, you could use this for a whole lot of things. You know, your physical things, the stomach. If you eat a ton of food, your stomach will be dilated. It will go through dilatation, or your heart maybe if it's if you work at it real good, it's going to get stronger and bigger. But the definition is more about, seems kind of negative, like it's being stretched too much. Yeah, beyond normal dimensions. Maybe you don't want these things to be stretched out so far. And then, of course, you can talk about it. Oh, I guess, okay, so overwork, maybe if your heart is overworked, it's gone through dilatation. If it's diseased or uh, abnormal relaxation, that's an interesting one. So if it's relaxed too much or too hard, if you can you relax too hard? It's gone through dilatation. Hmm. Okay, to B, the synonym is the number two definition for the word dilation, which is going to be later. I guess I would have thought that that would have been the word, not dilatation. I wonder why they're different. Three, the action of expanding and the state of being expanded is dilatation. Four, a dilated part or formation. Dilatational is an adjective. And there is no etymology. I guess we're just going to get it in this next word. Um, And then it's not, it does not seem like it's related at all, really, to dilatant or dilatancy, other than maybe... um, when maybe when this rock turns into a solid it's it uh it's expanding and it's being stretched out i don't know maybe that's kind of a stretch the next word pardon me dilate or dilate verb from the 14th century starting with transitive number 1 is archaic to describe or set forth at length or in detail. So if you are talking about a thing for a long time in a lot of detail, that is dilate. Uh, but it's archaic, so yeah, this is a little a little odd, I think, to our modern brains. Number two, to enlarge or expand in bulk or extent. The synonyms are distend and widen. Definitely think of like your stomach, if it's distended, if it's, uh, that, that's an interesting thing that the body does. If it's not getting food, it gets distended and you get that belly. You know, there's those images of the kids in, in Africa, say, who are not getting a lot of food and they look like they're full because they got big bellies, but it's the opposite. I think I may have that right. So enlarging or expanding, that's dilate. That's what this whole word's about. Here is intransitive one to comment at length, and the synonym is discourse. Um, And this is usually used with the words on or upon. Dilate on, dilate upon. If you're just talking about a thing a lot, like I sometimes do here, I'm dilating my words. Uh, This one definitely seems related to the number one archaic transitive definition 
but I guess in that context it doesn't really get used. But it does get used in intransitive. Number two, to become wide, and the synonym is swell, as in the pupil of the eye dilates and contracts. The pupil is the black part. It gets bigger when it dilates, and when it's contracting, it gets smaller. My, my, the cats, when they're really interested in a thing, their eyes will dilate so they can see better what's going on. A synonym for all is the word expand. Dilatability, dilatability, that is a noun, if a thing can dilate or not. Dilatable, it's the same, same idea, adjective. And dilator or dilator is a noun. And uh, we actually talk about that word, the dilator, in the next episode. So, um, so you know, look out for that. The etymology says this is from the Latin dilatare, which literally means to spread wide, from uh, dis plus latus, which means wide, and there's more at the word latitude. So the latitude of the earth, I think those are the, um, see, I never, but I think those are the lines that go around. So like, uh, you know, the, the equator, uh, that's zero latitude. I think, I hope I have that right. If I don't, I'm going to be very mad at myself and sound very dumb, but I'm pretty sure that's correct. Zero latitude is the equator. And then if you go north, you've got, you know, five degrees latitude, 10 degrees latitude, etc. It's the goes around the world wide, the, the, yeah. And, um, and then if a thing is spreading wide, it's dilating. The next word, pardon me, dilated, adjective from the 15th century, number one, expanded laterally, especially being flat and widened, as in dilated leaves. If they're very flat and very wide leaves, they are dilated leaves. Number two, expanded normally or abnormally in all dimensions. All of the dimensions. The three dimensions that we have here, also the fourth dimension of time, and then all the other dimensions, which I won't bore you with. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, we haven't mentioned this here. Uh, no, no, we'll we'll talk about this in the next one. The last word, the very last word for this episode. Pardon me. Do you have any Dijon mustard? Dilation. D-I-L-A-T-I-O-N. Noun from the 15th century. Number one. The act or action of dilating. And then also, the state of being dilated. The synonyms are expansion and dilatation. It's the same word, basically. And then number two, the action or stretching or, no, the action of stretching or enlarging an organ or part of the body. Um, And most specifically, other than like the iris of the eye or the pupil of the eye or, you know, I guess the heart or the stomach. Um, The other thing that I think we probably think of mostly that goes through dilation, that gets dilated, is the cervix in a person with a uterus when they are getting ready to have a baby. And, uh, yeah, that happens. And, uh, you know, at a certain point, I think it's like 10 centimeters, give or take, that's when they're like, all right, that's about the size of a baby's head-ish, enough that you are ready to get this baby out of you. you. You hear that word, obviously, a lot when you're talking about g- going through labor. All right. I think that is it. Again, we are going to have a guest. We talk a little bit about that. Um, and I should also say that that episode will be tagged as explicit because of the things that we talk about. Um, but, you know everybody don't don't uh, don't be afraid of anything that's explicit come come listen to what we have to say listen to everything all right we need to talk about the words we had dihydroxyacetone dijon mustard 
Dick Dick. Dyke Dyke Dyke. Dictat. I think it's Dictat. I think I said Dictat. It's Dictat. Dill Dilantin Dilapidate Dilapidated Dilatancy Dilatant Dilatation Dilate Dilated and Dilation. Hmm. I'm not sure what to pick. I'm a little tempted to do Dijon mustard, even though I don't really like it. Uh, maybe dilapidated. I mean, that's a good word. That's a that's a very good word. You know, dikes are important. Uh, stopping the water, controlling the water, because we feel like God, humans. Um, di- any of those dilated words, I think, are also, you know, those are very important. But I don't know. I think I just like the word uh, dilapidated. Don't you like the word dilapidated? Don't you like the word dilapidated? It's a very fun word to say. Dilapidated, dilapidated, dilapidated. That is all the song. That's all. That's all that it needs to be. It's it's great. All right. I hope I hope that you're enjoying this show. I hope you come back again. Come come every time, and let's talk about the things. Uh, let's see. Sometimes I talk about the movies I watched recently. We rewatched Anna and the Apocalypse, which we saw five years ago, and uh, it's uh, it's a very fun, good movie. It is a what is it? It is a Christmas time Scottish teenager musical. Yeah. Oh, oh zombie movie. I forgot the most important part. <laughs> it's also a zombie movie. Uh, yeah, Anna and the Apocalypse. Highly recommended. Uh, ooh, what else? Anything? Uh, yeah. If you're into, uh, well, you know, it's, um, oh, I think I totally forgot to mention this. Uh, we recently had Christmas <laughs> a few days ago. I didn't ever say Merry Christmas. Um, I also missed the first day of Kwanzaa. Apologies for that. Um, I did mention Hanukkah, but you know, it's still the Christmas season. So, uh, if you like the Christmas horror movies, you should watch Violent Night, which I mentioned. You should also watch Christmas Bloody Christmas. Uh, I think we just watched that. There was another one about a Christmas robot, which I can't think of the name of, but that was a lot of fun. Unless that was Christmas Bloody Christmas. It might have been. That's a crazy fun movie. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye.